for Professor Jansen's class, you, you're done at 9.45. This, the the Q&A session for the first speaker will wrap up at 9.50. So unless you have to run to the other side of campus and you can hang out until 9.50, that'd be fantastic. And then it'd be a nice break point for, for, uh, for you guys to, to head out. Thanks to Professor Jansen for making this happen. It's exciting to see so many of you All right. Well, good morning. On behalf of the Center for Constitutional Studies, uh, welcome to Utah Valley University. I'm Scott Paul. I serve as the director of the Center for Constitutional Studies. My colleagues and I are thrilled to have all of you have to look both ways to see everyone. This is fantastic. Um, created in 2011, the Center for Constitutional Studies. Ooh, now it's, now it's for real. Uh, uh, the Center for Constitutional Studies is a nonpartisan academic institute that promotes the instruction, study, and research of constitutionalism. Our mission is to increase constitutional literacy at the local, state, and national levels in a nonpartisan manner. You can learn more about us at uvu.edu slash CCS, or you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, I need to acknowledge our distinguished friends and supporters here today. Our center is almost entirely funded uh, externally. So for years, we were supported by gifts from very generous donors. Recently, we've received funds from the Utah Legislature and the National Endowment for Humanities, but most of our support still comes from our wonderful donors, and I offer them my heartfelt thanks. I must also recognize, yes, thank you. Let's also recognize uh, here with us today are members of UVU's executive leadership team, including our president, Dr. Astrid Tuminez. We're very pleased to have you joining us for the start this morning. And we also have with us today members of the Utah legislature, and we're great, very grateful for your trust in what we're doing here in the Center for Constitutional Studies. I have incredible colleagues. They're responsible for every aspect of today. Carrie Dennis, Hank McIntyre, and Paige Larson, in particular, made today happen. Uh, also, our amazing Eric Zachary Wood, student research assistants, are taking care of us today. And always, if you see a well-dressed student kind of looking like they know what they're doing, that's one of our Wood assistants. They're fantastic. Um, we have no center without our students. Speaking of students, it is, it is wonderful to see hundreds of students here today. Um, we've got, as I mentioned before, Professor, Professor Dusty Jansen's American Heritage class over here to my left, um, and, and UVU students kind of filling from other classes, filling in the, uh, the rest of this section here. To the right, we've got upwards of 400 high school students and middle school students. Uh, Here is part of our K-12 Constitutional Literacy Initiative. We're thrilled to have them. Um, I think representing at least six schools, maybe more. Uh, they had to fight a school bus driver shortage to get here. I hope you, you high school students realize how cool your teachers are, and not just because they got you out of class today. They, they took the time to arrange to get you here for this special experience because they care about your education. Also for, for you, sorry everybody, to but you'll understand in just a minute, for, for you who are here thinking about college, consider UVU. <laughs> Take a look around while you're here today, just soak it in. This is a special place. So when you're making your college choice, remember UVU, especially if you like what you hear today. Um, if the constitution or law or government interests you, come study with us in the Center for Constitutional Studies. We actually have a scholarship for incoming students who are interested in constitutional studies. We'll send that info to your teachers who can pass it on to you. Before I get to the main event, I want to quickly invite you to our next big event. Renowned author and commentator, Arthur Brooks will headline our Fall Civ Civics Conference on Thursday, October 27th at 6 p.m and UVU's gorgeous Norda Concert Hall. So add that to your calendar. Arthur will speak on his book, Love Your Enemies. Check out uvu.edu slash ccs, middle of next week. 
or follow us on social media to get event registration details. With that, Cashlin English is going to introduce our speakers for this session. Cashlin is from Reno, Nevada. She is a philosophy major and a constitutional studies minor. She's also the student lead of the Quill Project, which we'll hear about later today, and the co-lead for our National Endowment for the Humanities student research team. If that's not enough, she's also a nationally ranked member of UVU's nationally ranked rodeo team. Cashlin. Yes, thank you for that, Scott. I appreciate it. And with that, I would like to introduce our wonderful speakers today. We're so grateful to have all of you here. First, we have Professor Kurt Lash is the E. Claiborne Robbins Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of Richmond. He teaches and writes about constitutional law. In 2021, he published the Reconstruction Amendments, the Essential Documents, a two-volume collection of the original documents relating to the framing and ratification of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Professor. Next, we have the lovely Dr. Nicholas Cole, a fond mentor of mine whom I appreciate dearly. He is a senior research fellow at the Pembroke College of Oxford University. He studies political thought in the 18th and 19th centuries. He's the director of the Quill Project, a collaborative effort between Pembroke College and Utah Valley University. Quill is the digital platform that visualizes how constitutions and treaties have been recognized over the last 200 years. Dr. Cole. Next, we have Erica Croft. She is a historian and researcher graduating magnum cum laude in 2021 in political science with a minor in constitutional studies from UVU. She worked on the Quill Project and contributed to the, the 1895 Utah State Convention Project. Her research interests include emancipation and reconstruction history, constitutional politics, and political thought. Erica. And finally, Kiana McAllister. She graduated with a degree in political science with a minor in constitutional studies from Utah Valley University. In 2018, she attended a study abroad program at the University of Oxford, where she studied the foundations of American constitutionalism. Kiana has been a research on the Federalism Project and is currently working on the Quill Project at the center. Kiana. Thank you, and again, welcome. And with that, let the games begin. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, it, is, it is such a thrill to be here and a, a thrill to see my friends who I met just earlier this summer in, at, um, at Oxford. And what you're about to hear um, in terms of the Quill Project and the, the kinds of materials that you can use uh, to study and research these incredibly important amendments is just far beyond. Um, anything that I was able to use when I first became a researcher. And it's absolutely thrilling to have a chance to, in, uh, to introduce the real, the real stars of the show. The thing you need to know, there's so many thrilling things about these, these colleagues, but one of the coolest thing is that Dr. Cole at Pembroke Colleagues uh, currently occupies the office uh, that Tolkien had when he was there. So Lord of the Ring fans, you know, this guy, he's got it. Yeah, he'll he'll set up photo opportunities if you go there. So you know it's available. Um, I'm just here. I'm just here to set the stage. I'll try to get out of the way um, uh, as quickly as quickly as possible. Um, Nicholas Cole, Kiana McAllister, and Erica Croft, and also with the assistance of Scott Paul, the team here um, at UVU, and also the team at Oxford. Again, they've just raised computer-assisted research of um, American constitutional law. Just amazingly uh, beyond um, anything that I grew up with. I'm, I'm old school, so I'm in the library. I, I grew up you know, looking for old, for old books. Uh, researchers today still you know, use books every, every now and then, but more and more they're using um, computer-assisted research. You're using right now, I'm sure all of you are using, or at least many of you are using computer-assisted research. And what they've done in the Quill Project is they've made it available for you to investigate historical documents and not just see what's inside them, and that's absolutely important. They're going to give you the ability to see history developing on the page. It's called visualized data and data visualization. And it's extraordinary because it's going to change the way you think about American history, and it's going to change the kind of projects that you ultimately decide, uh, decide to explore. Um, so they're letting me kind of set the stage, but really, you know, um, that project um, 
is just incredibly exciting. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the materials that they're, uh, that they're engaging, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And these are the so-called Reconstruction Amendments. And they're called that because they were added immediately after the Civil War, during the period that is often uh, referred to as Reconstruction. And you, made, you, you probably have read books on Reconstruction. You may have studied it just to, uh, to some degree. But it's generally viewed as a, as a period of time after the Civil War when um, the Union Army occupied uh, the former rebel states and um, Congress was endeavoring to pass statutes to secure a degree of, of equal rights uh, for Black Americans in the, in the Southern states. And that period of Reconstruction is often viewed as ending around, around 1877 when uh, the Republicans in Congress uh, agreed to withdraw the military from the Southern states in exchange for democratic support of the new Republican president and with the withdrawal of the Union troops, um, civil rights, black civil rights in the South um, just faded into non-existence and really doesn't become a serious issue of equal racial equality until you get into the 20th century and into the, into, into the civil rights era. So scholars who talk about reconstruction, that large period of about 12 years, generally view that period as ending in failure with the withdrawal of the um, of the union, uh, the union, union troops. What I want to talk about today, and what the Quill Project focuses on, is something that I call constitutional reconstruction. This involves a shorter period. It's about a five-year period immediately after the Civil War, when the United States engaged in an extraordinary, ongoing debate about the need to change, to alter, to reconstruct the American Constitution in the aftermath of the Civil War. This Reconstruction was a success. This gave us the 13th Amendment, the abolition of slavery, the 14th Amendment, the creation and establishment of the rights of national citizenship, and the 15th Amendment, which erased the color bar uh, from the right, uh, the right to vote. Building these amendments was an extraordinary project, and it's one that almost didn't happen. And that's an important part of the story. The 13th Amendment, when the House first voted on whether or not to abolish slavery in 1864, the vote failed. The individual sections of the 14th Amendment were first presented as individual constitutional amendments, and every one of them failed. The 15th Amendment almost didn't get passed at all due to the chaos in Congress at the time that they were framing it. And if Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton had had their way, ratification of that amendment would have failed. It's quite possible, if you put yourself back into the historical period, at the time that all of this was happening, there was no reason for you to think that we were going to end with three new amendments to the Constitution. We might only get two. We might have only gotten one. We might have gotten none at all. And it was only due to the extraordinary efforts of Americans, white and black, men and women, who involved themselves to the, you know, to the last effort, um, and some to their own death in their service in the Union Army, only because of their efforts that we actually successfully completed constitutional reconstruction and received the three amendments that are so important to American, American liberty, uh, liberty today. Now, what I want to talk about, and again, I want to get as quickly as possible to, to, um, uh, to question, questions and answers, but I want to talk about the attention that Americans focused on the creation of the constitutional text that ultimately became these, um, uh, these particular amendments. Getting an amendment into the Constitution is extremely difficult. It, the process is laid out in Article 5 of the Constitution, and it takes two rounds of voting, and it's not even ordinary, it's not ordinary voting. Before you can even propose a constitutional amendment, you have to get two thirds support of both houses of Congress. And that only gets the proposal on the table. Before it actually becomes a part of the constitution, it has to go through a second round of voting. And this time you have to get three quarters agreement of every state in the union. This super majoritarian process allows a minority to block a proposed amendment at every step in the way. 
there must be extraordinarily deep and broad consensus of both, across both houses of Congress and the country itself, or the amendment will never, will never succeed. And that need for super majoritarian consent does not advantage amendments with simple vague language with ideas of high principle that maybe later politicians will work out uh, down the road. Quite the opposite. The greater the possibility that a vague text might be manipulated by courts or later, later Congresses, the stronger the argument that the minority has that that amendment should not be passed at all. The only way you're gonna successfully get an amendment framed and passed is if you've used clear language and you've communicated an idea that is clearly supported by both houses of Congress and by, and ultimately will be agreed to by the country of the country as a whole. So historians who claim that the framers of the reconstruction amendments intentionally produced a vague and ambiguous text seem to have missed the days, the weeks and the months of congressional debate over the precise wording of the amendments with key players at every moment threatening to and sometimes succeeding in derailing the process due to their concerns about the text. And the seriousness of purpose and attentiveness to the language that was being proposed was a concern that went far beyond the halls of Congress. When we engaged in this grand national debate, it was very different than the debate that got us our original constitution. Some of you know this, that original Philadelphia constitution was secret. The people didn't know what went on at that convention until decades later, like 1840, down the road when Madison's notes were eventually, eventually published. When Congress was debating the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery or the 14th Amendment with national citizenship or giving uh, Black Americans the right to vote, all of this took place in the public and in the public eye with public input. National, regional, and local newspapers had reporters who were actually in Congress at the time they recorded the debates, they published them in their newspapers. Newspaper editors then commented on those debates, published their comments, and then those comments were sent back to members in Congress where they affected, in some cases, uh, the actual course, uh, course of debate. So the information was actually a two-way street between the people in Congress and the people, um, the people outside of Congress, and the voices who could comment on what were happening were not simply privileged white male property owners. At the time of Reconstruction, you had the civil rights newspapers. You had the women's rights newspapers of the Revolution. You had, you had abolitionist newspapers, uh, the Liberator. You had black civil rights newspapers like Frederick Douglass's newspapers. All of these voices were attentive to what was happening in Congress and were commenting on a daily basis and giving their input in terms of what they would support and what they wouldn't support. And in fact, there were so many voices in play and so many opinions that were being pushed around that it's something of a miracle that any proposed amendment survived the process of Article 5 at all. And the fact that three actually got ratified is beyond comprehension. In fact, I'm certain that it's beyond comprehension, which is why I currently support efforts like the Quill Project to help us understand what occurred, what kind of arguments were actually successful, and why certain texts were placed into these amendments and why certain texts were actually, actually excluded. Now, in the, time, in the time that I have remaining and in the spirit of just setting this, the stage, I just wanna talk about two aspects of this project and two aspects of this extraordinary um, national conversation. I wanna talk about Republican constitutional theory that led up to the Civil War and informed Republicans after the Civil War. And I want to talk about the passage of the 13th Amendment, the amendment that got the ball rolling and eventually led to two additional, two additional amendments. So let's start with Republican theory. And I want to do so by starting at the beginning of the Quill Project's new collection that you're going to learn a little bit more about um, in a moment. The collection begins in 1860, right at the threshold of, um, of the Civil War. And they titled this opening section, The Road to Civil War. And notice what they do. The collection doesn't start at 1864. When you begin the debates on the 13th Amendment, it starts before then. It starts actually as the states were beginning to secede from the Union. And that makes this collection's entry point, its opening story, a story about the infamous Corwin Amendment. For those of you who do not know, and you should know, the Corwin Amendment was the first proposed 13th Amendment. 
And that first proposed 13th Amendment didn't abolish slavery. That amendment would have guaranteed states the right to maintain chattel slavery. Now, you might think that a proposed constitutional amendment protecting slavery is an odd place to begin a story about freedom and liberty. I think it's actually a perfect place to begin that story of constitutional reconstruction. Understanding this first pro-slavery 13th Amendment reveals the nature of Republican constitutional theory at the doorstep to the Civil War. And once you understand that theory, you understand everything that happens next. So let's take a look at the Corwin Amendment drafted by Thomas Corwin. I know I should have a PowerPoint. I really should. I'm usually really good about that, but I don't, I'm, I'm not having that right now. So be attentive, be attentive. Here's the language of the Corwin Amendment. No amendment shall be made to the Constitution which will authorize or give Congress the power to abolish or interfere within any state with the domestic institutions thereof, including that of persons held to labor or service by the laws of said state. Congress passed the Corwin Amendment soon after Lincoln's election in 1860, and it was part of an effort to convince the slaveholding states not to secede from the Union. The amendment actually went to the states for ratification in March 1861, and a number of states actually ratified this amendment before the Civil War broke out, but once that happened, it rendered the entire effort, effort moot. Now, my students, when I teach my seminar on the Reconstruction Amendments, they're generally shocked to learn how close the country came to ratifying a pro-slavery 13th Amendment. They're even more surprised to find out that the newly elected President Abraham Lincoln declared that he had no problem with an amendment that constitutionalized the rights of the states to decide the issue of slavery for themselves. And how can that be possible? How could Republicans possibly support such an amendment? And how could they so drastically change their position? only three years later. The answer can be found by studying the nature of the original constitution and the role of constitutional federalism in the Northern states. As historian Sean Wilentz points out in his book, No Property in Man, in the years following the revolution, the newly independent states immediately divided over whether to maintain or abolish the colonial practice of chattel slavery. Northern states moved towards abolition while Southern states maintained the earlier colonial practice. That regional divide over slavery became national policy when Congress passed the 1787 Ordinance for the Northwest Territory. In language originally drafted by Thomas Jefferson, the ordinance declared that, quote, there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude in the said territory, otherwise than in punishment of crimes whereof the party shall have been duly convicted. That passage ultimately found its way into section one of the 13th Amendment. And there's a specific reason why it did, and I'll talk about that in a moment. The 1820 Compromise, Missouri Compromise, continued this north-south divide by prohibiting Congress from admitting a slave state into the Union, north of the 3630 parallel. Together, the Northwest Ordinance and the Missouri Compromise guaranteed abolition in the northern states and slavery in the southern states. And the Federalist 10th Amendment guaranteed the right of all of these states to decide for themselves what to do about the issue of slavery. Now to the most radical of abolitionists, the fact that the Federalist Constitution allowed slavery in the Southern states rendered the Constitution in their opinion to be an unacceptable deal with the devil. More moderate abolitionists on the other, on the other hand, embraced constitutional federalism as a mechanism for advancing the cause of freedom. Although federalism allowed slavery in the South, it also guaranteed the rights of the Northern states to embrace abolition. And Northern free states used their Federalist freedom to enact personal liberty laws that prohibited state officials from enforcing the Fugitive Slave Acts. They passed laws which conferred the status of citizenship on their Black residents. And they protected the due process rights of their Northern Black citizens. The Southern states opposed all of this. They objected to Northern states' efforts to resist slavery, and they denied that any state could confer the rights of national citizenship on Black Americans. And in Dred Scott against Sanford, the Supreme Court agreed with the Southern states. According to Chief Justice Taney, the discriminatory treatment of Black Americans at the time of the founding 
suggested that the framers of the Constitution never intended to allow for the possibility of Black American citizenship. Nor could the federal government prohibit slave owners from carrying their slave, their so-called property into the territories. Tani's opinion was not only anti-Black, it was also anti-federalism. Dred Scott denied that Northern states had the power to bestow the rights of citizenship on their own Black residents. The new Republican Party loudly objected to Dred Scott. As far as Republicans were concerned, the Constitution was neither anti-Black nor anti-federalism. Republicans insisted that Northern states remain constitutionally free to abolish slavery, confer citizenship on their Black residents, and the federal government had full power to abolish slavery in the territories. And it was this constitutional theory that prevailed in the presidential election of 1860. Lincoln and the incoming Republican administration would respect the right of Southern states to maintain slavery, but they would also respect the right of Northern states to pursue abolition. And they insisted that the federal government had the full power to ban slavery in the territories. Such policies, of course, were unacceptable to the slaveholding states. So when Lincoln and the Republicans won the election, states like South Carolina, decided to secede, and they called on other states to join them in secession. It was in response to that secessionist movement that Congress passed the Corwin Amendment. Let's listen to that amendment again. Quote, no amendment shall be made to the Constitution which will authorize or give to Congress the power to abolish or interfere within any state with the domestic institutions thereof, including that of persons held to labor or service by the laws of said state. The Corwin Amendment left the issue to the states. And this is Republican constitutional theory in a nutshell. Federalism allows each state to decide whether or not to embrace slavery or abolition. And notice that the amendment says nothing about congressional power to abolish slavery in the territories. Lincoln did not oppose this amendment because he recognized it was nothing more than a restatement of Republican theory. The slaveholding states also recognized it as Republican theory and they rejected it and they decided to secede anyway. The Congress that remained was dominated by Republicans and it was guided by Republican constitutional principles. And it was this Republican Congress that ultimately passed the 13th Amendment. Now, just briefly, Let's talk about that amendment. I imagine that many of you already know kind of the basic outlines of the 13th Amendment. Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation ended slavery behind enemy lines, but it left slavery untouched in the loyal border states. It, it was also unclear whether or not the proclamation would continue to operate when the war ended. Persons freed by the Emancipation Proclamation faced the prospect of being returned to their former masters as only temporarily confiscated property. Before the war, Republicans had been willing to allow slavery to exist and hopefully die in the Southern states, but secession and a bloody civil war convinced them that the institution of slavery was not just a moral evil, it was unacceptably destabilizing the constitutional government. Slavery was not an indelible part of the constitution. Slavery had torn the constitution apart. Republicans concluded that even if federalism should be preserved, slavery must be abolished throughout the Union, and they got to work immediately. They abolished slavery in the District of Columbia, a territory where they had control. They abolished slavery in the territories across the United States. In the opinion by Justice, um, Justice Taney and Dred Scott, to the contrary, be damned. They also wanted to permanently end slavery in the states, but that was something currently beyond their power. To abolish slavery in the states would require a constitutional amendment. And at the time, it was not clear that such an amendment would pass. However much slavery might be associated with the rebellious South, it was simply true that loyal border states still maintained slavery. And Northern Democrats continued to press the argument that it would be unconstitutional to remove slavery um, from an option among the states. According to the Democrats, we had a pro-slavery constitution, and it was beyond the authority of Congress to propose an amendment that would take it out of the constitution. So Republicans were faced 
with having to convince a super majority, a super majority of their colleagues and of the ratifying public and convince them that abolishing slavery was not only constitutional, but it also advanced the hopes and the desires of the nation's original founders. To help them make this argument, Republicans drafted the 13th Amendment so that it echoed the words of Thomas Jefferson in the 1787 Northwest Ordinance. Quoting the ordinance almost verbatim, this new proposed amendment declared that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. By basing their amendment on the famous language of Jefferson's ordinance, Republicans signaled to the country that opposition to slavery was rooted in the ideas and actions of the nation's founders and in the country's founding documents. Democrats themselves continued to oppose the particular amendment. And at that point in 1864, they continued to have the numbers to allow them to defeat the original proposed 13th Amendment. When the House voted on June 15th, 1864, although a majority of the House of Representatives supported the 13th Amendment, it simply did not reach the two thirds majority and it failed. Whether there would be a second attempt now depended on the results of the 1864 presidential election. An election that as of that June did not look particularly hopeful for Lincoln and the Republicans. The Union military campaign had stalled and the country was growing weary of an astonishingly bloody civil war. Democratic presidential candidate and former general of the Union Army, George McClellan, promised a quick and honorably negotiated end to the civil war. And Lincoln himself predicted that McClellan was gonna win. Once again, we have to face the fact of contingency, the possibility that none of this might've happened. Today, we see a straight line from the Emancipation Proclamation to the Gettysburg Address, to the defeat of the Confederacy, to the 13th Amendment, and so on. But someone standing on the ground at the time would have seen something completely different. Northern Republicans in the fall of 1864 saw an unenforceable Emancipation Proclamation, an obviously weary Abraham Lincoln, no clear path to military or electoral victory, and a defeated proposed 13th Amendment. Appreciating the contingency of this particular moment allows us to better appreciate the remarkable efforts of those who, even though they were surrounded by defeat, nevertheless continued to fight for abolition, some giving the last full measure of their devotion. Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation opened the door to military service for free Black Americans. Many of those Black soldiers were with General Tecumseh Sherman when on September 6th, 1864, the Union Army defeated the Confederate forces at Atlanta, Georgia. That victory reignited the Republican prospects in the coming election. The Republicans had run on a platform promising military victory and an amendment abolishing slavery. When Lincoln and the Republicans prevailed, the Union cause and the abolition amendment got a second chance. Lincoln convinced the House Republicans to immediately hold a second vote on the abolition amendment and not leave the issue to the next Congress, which was months away from being called into session. That of course raises the question, why would Lincoln or anyone else think that a second vote by the exact same group of people would have any different result? According to director Steven Spielberg, in his otherwise magnificent movie, Lincoln, Lincoln and his administration believed that they could bribe enough Democrats to switch their vote. The movie is wonderful, but it makes cynicism and filthy lucre the hero of the 13th Amendment and not the heroic black soldiers who secured victory in Atlanta and who pricked the conscience of the nation and the voters of 1864 who chose freedom over slavery. Spielberg also ignores the fact that since Congress's first vote, the border states had begun to abolish slavery on their own initiative. It was not bribery that turned the tide towards abolition. It was the efforts of individual Americans, black and white, who turned the country decisively away from slavery. And even the Democrats understood this. As Missouri Democrat James Rollins put it, quote, he had voted against the 13th Amendment the prior summer. And those same views had subsequently led him to oppose Lincoln in the election. But 
Thinking about the matter now, he was inclined to doubt whether under all the circumstances, the people have not at, not at last acted more wisely than I did. Rollins declared that he was going to change his vote and he would now support the abolition that the country itself had turned to favor. On January 31st, 1865, the House held a second vote on the 13th Amendment, and this time the proposal passed on a vote of 119 to 56, two more votes than was needed for passage. So please turn in your books to page 531 of, of the Congressional Globe, 38th Congress, second session. This page records the actual events in the House of Representatives at the exact moment the clerk announced the passage of the 13th Amendment. This is how it is written in the official record. Quote, the announcement of passage was received by the House and by the spectators with an outburst of enthusiasm. The members on the Republican side of the House instantly sprung to their feet and regardless of parliamentary rules, applauded with cheers and clapping of hands. The example was followed by the male spectators in the galleries whose members included Frederick Douglass's son. They were crowded to excess and they waved their hats and cheered loud and long, while the ladies, hundreds of whom were present, rose in their seats, waved their handkerchiefs and participated in and added to the general excitement and intense interest of the scene. This lasted for several minutes. That is my favorite passage in the entire Congressional Globe. And I believe Americans should read it every year on January 31st, followed by fireworks, public toasts, and the reading of the roster of the Black Soldier 54th Massachusetts Regiment. It is one of the greatest moments in American history. And it almost didn't happen. But once it did, it changed everything. There had been a hope that passing abolition and abolishing slavery would create a situation in which black Americans throughout the country would automatically become citizens of the United States. And there wouldn't be any need to pass additional amendments or pass additional legislation. By 1865, however, it was clear that the South had no intention of recognizing black citizenship. And instead they passed the black codes, the black codes which severely restricted equal civil rights for black Americans. And in many cases left them open to arrest and being sold out um, as forced labor. It was gonna take more than the 13th Amendment, but the country now knew how to do it. The country had now become a country which amended its constitution. And if the South wasn't ready to recognize black citizenship, then we would constitutionalize black citizenship. And we'd pass a 14th Amendment that in its opening lines would declare that any person born or naturalized in the United States was a citizen of the United States. Oh, and by the way, and of the, of the state in which they reside. And if that wasn't enough to secure the development of black citizenship and equal rights, then they would do more. We would pass a 15th amendment, one that would guarantee the rights, the right to vote regardless of race. These all came about because we overcame the hurdle, the hurdle presented by the 13th amendment and the idea that the people had in their hands the ability to change the constitution in the direction of freedom. That is what we celebrate today. And that is what is presented to our gaze in the incredible work of the Quill Project, a project that lets us not only study, but actually see these events as they occurred. It's an honor to be able to introduce them. And I look forward to hearing more about the project. Thank you. All right, I know some students have to excuse yourself, so now's a good time. Um, so, but we do have time just to take a couple questions for Professor Lash. So we've got microphones so our folks online can hear them. I so, can hear them. So, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, uh, questions for Professor Lash. Okay, here's one. All right. Uh, Professor, you mentioned that mentioned Elizabeth, Elizabeth Katie, Katie Stanton, Stanton and, and Susan, Susan B. Anthony, Susan Anthony were, Anthony were, were factors, were factors in almost factors derailing, in derailing, derailing the 13th, the 13th Amendment. Amendment. Did I get that right? Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, 
one of the more one of the more controversial things that I just said very quickly, hoping to get away with it, was the possibility of failure of all of these all of these amendments. Not everyone in the country uh, was in favor of changing the constitution, and we're not just talking about opposition in the South, although we are talking about opposition in the South. There were also elements in the North who were resisting constitutional constitutional change. I talked about some of that um, in terms of the 13th, uh, 13th Amendment. But when it came time to think about black suffrage and whether or not to give the freedmen the right to vote, opposition actually came in substantial form from elements in the North and not in the South. By the time you get to 1869 and 1870, Actually, there had been black suffrage, uh, black suffrage registration for Black Americans in the South under the Reconstruction Acts. In order to give Black Americans in the South the opportunity to vote on the proposed 14th Amendment, the Reconstruction Acts directed the Union Army to register Black Americans to vote, give them an opportunity to vote on new governments, and then allow those new governments to decide whether or not they wanted to ratify the 14th Amendment. And they did. Black Americans in the South not only voted for new governments and, and in favor of the 14th Amendment, they also elected themselves into office. And you have, by the time you get to 1870, you have South Carolina, remember the state that started the Civil War? You have South Carolina now with a majority black legislature that was more than happy to ratify not only the 14th Amendment, but also a 15th Amendment, which prohibited racial discrimination in voting. So that's happening, that's happening in the South. In the meantime, the women's rights movement in the North had participated in the effort to abolish slavery. And so um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony had encouraged members of the um, Equal Rights Movement and the Women's Rights Movement to support the abolition of slavery. But their hope had been once the attention turned to the 14th Amendment and the idea that civil rights now were gonna be extended to everyone um, throughout the South and even throughout the North, they had hoped that that extension of civil rights was also going to include the right of women to vote. And they began to turn all of their efforts towards women's suffrage, as opposed to securing civil rights, black civil rights in the South. They didn't get the right to vote um, in the 14th Amendment. So when the conversation went further and now began to look like there was gonna be a, suff a suffrage amendment in the, uh, in the 15th Amendment that was only going to ban racial discrimination but not guarantee women the right to vote, they decided to come out in opposition. And they came out forcefully and in racist language denounced the idea of giving the right to vote to ignorant blacks as opposed to educated white women. It's one of the most unfortunate moments and startling moments um, throughout that entire history because these were people who had been so supportive of freedom now ended up fracturing the whole civil rights movement um, uh, throughout, uh, throughout the South. Part of the collection that I just published includes the articles that were being published by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony at that time in the revolution, their, um, their newspaper. And one of, the, one of the more remarkable scenes that occurs at this time is that Frederick Douglass, who had been working with the women's rights movement, you know, he was there right at Seneca Falls um, calling for women's right to vote and equal, and equal rights long before the Civil War. He was still working alongside of, side of them, but now he was having to appear on a stage calling for in French um, uh, the vote for the freedmen in the South, but he had to sit there while Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton were denouncing ignorant Blacks. Um, it really is a startling moment, but Douglas, just, he just didn't bat an eye when it was his turn to speak. He thanked everyone for being there. He said he supported women's rights to, right to vote, but he said, listen, in terms of need, right now, the right to vote for Black Americans is a matter of life and death. And so I will continue to support the 15th Amendment, but I also will continue to support universal suffrage um, going down the road. So it's, it's, a, it's, um, it's a hard part of the history, but it's part of the history that needs to be told. Thank you. For the for the sake of time, I know we had a question here, and we definitely want to take a question from our high school students, but maybe we can do that between the break. So we're going to transition over um, real quick. And just uh, just a, as a personal side, when working with Kiana and Erica in the National Archives, uh, they knew exactly what they were looking for. I had no idea what I was looking for. And so they just sent me on a, on a what was a wild goose chase. But on that wild goose chase, uh, it was it was an incredible moment to 
I, I was flipping through the record uh, and it goes chronologically. And so I know I know what hadn't happened before I came to and held in my hands the first rendition of the 13th Amendment, which it was an emotional moment for me because that was the beginning of the end of this, this ugliest chapter in our nation's history. But then it doesn't stop there. Kept going forward and, and found early renditions of the 15th Amendment, which included one uh, where uh, early proposed amendments where a little carrot was added uh, a after race and it said, or sex, or age for our young voters or aspiring young voters. So it was, it was so darn close, but another 50 years. Thank you, Professor Lash. Before this, though, it's, it's not one of the Sarah Sage films. I've got that here. It's really one of my favorite Syrian material. Um, sort of taking Eve and Eve together in this way. Right. Fingers crossed. This is. Uh, the bane of uh, of all talks is waiting for the tech to work. Brilliant. Let's see. Okay, why are we uh, why are we here? So um, we're at a very interesting moment in American history. The Supreme Court of the United States has basically instructed everyone to become better historians. Those of you who've been following the um, judgments this summer um, may have noticed that actually what the Supreme Court has said is that they want to pay much closer attention to uh, the phrase they like to use is deeply rooted uh, parts of American history. But what they really mean by that is that they want to pay much closer attention to how the, the, the language of state and federal uh, documents was written and um, what the people who wrote those documents might have meant. And as it happens, we've just published this summer the work of, of two years of work by students at UVU and a team in Oxford looking at the period between 1860 and 1875 when um, the 14th Amendment, well, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments, and related pieces of legislation were being passed by Congress. And we didn't start that project knowing that the Supreme Court would start telling everybody to pay attention to this kind of material. Um, but it's really fascinating to, to have published this just weeks after they told everybody they had to start thinking about it more. This language in the 14th Amendment is critical for you as Americans today. There is not a right that you enjoy that doesn't in some way interact with this language in the 14th Amendment. Um, all of the Federal Bill of Rights um, protections, insofar as they apply to the states, apply to the states because of the language in the 14th Amendment. So this is really a, a critical piece of language, not only for the history of the end of slavery, but for the uh, contemporary history of America. Well, I'm interested in how words get written. And for the last few years, with the help of people on both sides of the Atlantic, have been trying to sort out how we might study in more detail um, the, the processes by which language is agreed upon. And I think it is one of the most unique things about America that you have written your constitutional texts collaboratively. You have not generally asked one very clever person to write a constitution for you in the way that the ancient Athenians might have done with Solon and others, but you have had hundreds of people involved, thousands of people even, in writing your state and federal constitutional texts. And we've put together a computer platform for studying that 
and there's been a lot of work both on the history and on the sort of tech side um, to try and get this to work. And this is what running this project feels like sometimes. Um, but uh, none of the work that we've done would have been possible without the most amazing collaboration between the place that I work, Pembroke College in Oxford, which is 400 years old next year, um, and Utah Valley University, one of the world's newest universities. And this collaboration is one of the great privileges of my career. And the students here have worked incredibly hard on a number of projects um, for the better part of, of seven or eight years now. And we look forward to a collaboration going into the future. And I'll say more about that at, at lunchtime and what the next steps are. But our job really is to turn the detailed records of debate into something intelligible and that can be studied by experts and by um, the wider public in much more detail than has ever been possible before by showing really the work that went into crafting the specific language, by allowing you to see on the screen how the process of debate works. And if you're interested in the sort of um, more formal academic write-up of it, uh, along with my colleague, Grace Mallon, who will be talking a bit later this morning, we have an article uh, that, you, that you can read that, that talks about the, the thinking behind it. But we try and map out the sort of processes where documents are sent through lots of different committees. I put this, this slide on the screen, don't worry about the detail, but it, it shows the committee structure of the original 1787 convention. Um, that's where we started this work. What we've discovered is that at state level, things look impossibly com uh, complicated. I've got uh, colleagues at London University helping us try and sort out how we try and visualize data that is an order of magnitude more complicated when you come to state level work than the federal level work. And here's the same shot of just the 14th Amendment debates, all of the committee work that went into trying to sort out the language of the 14th Amendment. So this is an incredibly complicated process that we're trying to capture for you online. Just in terms of the 14th Amendment and the um, Civil Rights Act that went with it, there are over 3,000 individual decisions taken during the framing of that language. And those of you who know the 14th Amendment will know how short it is. But that's the level of complexity and detail that we're dealing with. And we try and lay this out for you so that you can see how the language evolves, so that you can see which proposals succeeded and which failed, and the contexts within which they succeeded and failed. And this is work that is intended both for experts and for the rest of the American public as well. It's a project that has involved everything, going into archives to find committee papers that have never before been published, digitizing those, transcribing those, putting them online, working out how to develop the platform for analysis that we've built, and finally trying to work out how to make that material available for educators. So that's a very complicated and difficult set of tasks. And the students at UVU and the staff at the center have been critical in helping us think through that. I'm not going to take a lot of credit for the hard work that has been done here. That's going to be explained to you by two of the students who worked on this project in just a second. And it's my uh, honor and duty to introduce them. But here are some of the themes that this particular project on the reconstruction amendments presented for us. First of all, the choice of material was difficult. We clearly couldn't put online the complete uh, sort of mapping of 15 years of debates in Congress. So we had to make some choices and we had to think rigorously about those choices. We had to think about how we develop user interfaces designed for much simpler processes for this much more complicated process. I think it's an important thing to say that this project is about how texts come into existence. Now, the lawyers will have different theories about what that means for interpretation, and I leave that up to them. But I think studying that process of debate in its own right and civility in its own right, if you want to think of it like that, 
is an important aspect of this project. And there is further work needed uh, on how we develop these tools further. Before I hand over, I just want to say one other thing. Um, anything that is good in the work that has been done, all of the archival work that has been done, all of the transcription, selection of material, detailed work, everything that is good that you will see as you explore these projects, that is the product of hard work by the students here at UVU. Anything that is not to your liking in terms of method, in terms of difficult user interfaces, in terms of deficiencies, that's all my fault. Uh, and with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Erica and Kiana to talk you through the work that they did. Hello. How does this button work? Sorry, we're just waiting for our slides. Okay, here we go. Hi, good morning. I'm Kiana McAllister. Erica Croft. Uh, we're the two main researchers that have been working on this project uh, since its inception. Um, we started this project three years ago um, as undergraduates here at UVU. Um, at the time, we really didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. Um, we had kind of the basic materials and we thought that it would take us a couple months to get through our research. Um, and we were quickly uh, corrected as we started reading the records. Um, we're both non-traditional students. Uh, well, we were. We both since graduated. Um, so we kind of brought different perspectives and different life experiences to our work. Um, and it's been a real joy working with Dr. Cole and um, other students at the center uh, to do this project. So we're really honored to be here today. Um, this, these projects took us uh, everywhere um, through years and years and thousands and thousands of pages of records. Um, it took us to the National Archives in Washington, DC, which was a very, very cool experience. So um, we're just gonna kind of walk you through what we've done and how we did it. And we hope that it's helpful as you guys, especially high school students, if you're interested in history, we hope that these projects can really bring it to life for you. Like, um, like we were able to really engage with these materials um, while doing the research. The learning experience. Sorry. Oh, oh the big green. There we go. Okay, Dr. Cole just walked you through Quill. Um, but I just wanted to show you kind of a more specific example from our research um, in Quill. So here at the top is the first draft of the 15th Amendment. You can see that the text is quite different from that to the bottom text, which is the final text that we know today. Um, our mission here was to use a congressional records, this page up here, we read thousands and thousands of them <laughs> over the last couple of years, and to help show how it went from its first draft to its last draft. Um, so we've broken those records down, created these events in a timeline to show you all of that entire process. Um, we initially just started working with the Congressional Globe as our primary resource, we quickly found that it didn't have everything that we needed. Um, it was missing a lot of um, information, bill numbers, um, texts of documents. So we had to expand um, our source material. So we, we've brought together various sources and put it in one place. So you guys don't have to go on a treasure hunt um, to find all this information. It's right here in Quill for you. Um, just as an, an example here, this is the Third Reconstruction Act. Um, here, the, in order to create the single event in Quill, we had to pull resources from three different materials. So here in the Congressional Globe is where we see the proposal of the document. 
However, it gives us no other information. We don't have the bill number, we don't have the text. So we had to go to the journal in order to get the bill number, but it still didn't have the text. So we had to go to the legislative index to find the text of the, the document. So again, we've kind of compounded all of these different sources into one place so that it's not, you don't have to go and find it yourself. So to kind of explain why it was a little more difficult than we expected, the major blueprint for our work was creating these kind of interactive digital models of constitutional conventions on the state level. Um, and we also sort of imagined the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment as separate projects. And so we started this in the summer of 2019, and we sort of imagined it was starting with what became the 13th Amendment and working backwards. And what we found was that just like wasn't satisfactory. Um, so we were really dissatisfied with the outcome of that. We finished it in a few months, but we realized that when we were exposed to the materials and the records themselves, that there was just so much that was missed, that there were so many relevant debates and proposals just peppered throughout in ways that weren't directly connected. So we had to survey this huge volume of congressional material in these congressional sessions that cover everything from railroads to civil rights. And you have to pluck out of that what is relevant. And as Dr. Cole said before, that's a like a very conscious choice. And we took that very seriously. So uh, we basically came up with a way of dealing with the records that was different. When we worked with conventions, we could assume that every material that was related to the convention was relevant to the digital model, but we had to basically stitch together our own narrative of the progression of these amendments with what was available to us. And we understood that that was a very conscious and subjective activity. Um, this is an example of the complexity and how we had to be selective with the material. Um, as you can see, as Erica explained, kind of the simple process is taking the end result and working back to its beginning, um, which is illustrated kind of here at the top. Underneath is really how the drafting of the 14th Amendment actually went. So we had to go through and find all of the documents that um, were influential and impactful on the drafting um, because it went through a very different process. They had um, dozens of proposals coming in. Those proposals was, were sent to a committee and within that committee, they sifted through, pulled different aspects of different uh, propositions to create a whole new document. Um, they actually created two versions of that document and sent a version to the House and to the Senate, both with different bill numbers. So it didn't, our original process of just taking the end result and working back didn't, we couldn't do that here because it wouldn't give a full story. So we had to be very mindful and conscious about what was in the records, what we included, um, what was left out. Um, but here you can see how complex that process was. Yeah, so basically after we rediscovered this, after being very dissatisfied with our work, we started over again and we surveyed all of this material and we thought about essentially embracing the subjective aspect of the project and we outlined what we wanted to create anew. And we became really dedicated to both creating a free platform that was really accessible, that combined all of these eclectic materials that you would spend hours searching for alone and creating this own, our own sort of telling of what took place. So before we tell you what's actually in the project and what you can access, we just wanna briefly discuss what our project isn't. And our project is not originalism Google. I'm afraid you will not be able to type into the search bar, what does due process mean and get the answer. Unfortunately, we think we found that it's much more complicated than that, but we do think your exposure to the materials can teach you a lot about the outcome. So what our project actually includes, it starts at the Corwin Amendment and goes all the way to the Civil Rights Act of uh, 1875. 
So we start with the Corwin Amendment, which uh, Kurt Lash so eloquently laid out for us earlier before, but it also contains things such as the Crittenden Compromise, which was a similar proposition, the emancipation of DC and the emancipation of the territories, as well as interactions between President James Buchanan and the legislature at the time. So why did we choose to start with the Corwin Amendment? We were kind of set up for this already, but I do have a little more to say which is that not only does it give us the opportunity to look at emancipation and civil rights progress in the way that it isn't a straight line to freedom, but uh, it does that in a lot of complicated ways. First, just by starting with the Corrin Amendment and learning more about what Republican constitutional theory really was. And in that, that allows researchers to really explore the question, why anti-slavery, why abolition, and that is a very educational question for this project that sort of what Eric Foner calls the anti-slavery impulse, why, why abolition? And you come to learn through debates on questions of colonization, which was the idea that after emancipating the slaves, ship every freedman out of the country. And popular propositions like that teach us that Republican legislatures our Republican legislators weren't interested in sort of this grand vision of a multiracial society. It was a very divisive and complicated process. I just wanted to add to that um, throughout all of our projects, but specifically this one, we had to engage with a lot of difficult um, content, right? Uh, as I said, we've read through thousands of these pages in the records, which have included speeches. Um, and some of those were difficult to read. Um, the, the just the blatant racism in them is just shocking. And it was uncomfortable to read that. But we didn't we didn't shy away from that and in including it in the projects. Um, we want we had to engage with that content. And it was very it was illuminating and it helped us to be better people and better historians. And we're hoping that that can be the case for everyone that uses these projects. They may be difficult questions uh, to deal with and it could be uncomfortable, but that level of engagement with history is just invaluable. And we hope that you guys can find um, it just as invaluable as we have. Well, certainly at the time, it like, it wasn't believed that a multiracial society was possible. And it's a national, it was a natural inclination for both of us to kind of search for heroes and search for heroes of the story. But unfortunately, what we found was that simply couldn't be the case. It was really deeply believed that like slavery was an agitator because it brought non-white people into the country. And so a large proportion of this anti-slavery political energy came from a very racist place. And that's pretty clear even up through the debates for the 13th Amendment, which we include alongside the Wade Davis bill, which is the earliest reconstruction proposal that we could find. So the 14th Amendment project, I think, is kind of the focal point of um, our research, right? As, um, Professor Lash and Dr. Cole have pointed out that kind of sits at the center of um, history, especially constitutional history and legal history. Um, so we originally started with just the drafting of the 14th Amendment as our scope. Um, we quickly found that we needed, it was essential for us to add the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Um, there's such a connection between the two. Um, these major uh, themes within the first section of the 14th Amendment, like citizenship, naturalization, equal protection under the law, all of these were massively debated during the drafting of the Civil Rights Act, not necessarily the drafting of the 14th Amendment. So we knew we had to bring these, um, bring the Civil Rights Act in to kind of give a fuller picture and really get to the meat of those um, important clauses in the 14th Amendment. Um, there was also a question of constitutionality about passing the Civil Rights Act. Congress spends a long time just debating whether or not they have the power to pass the Civil Rights Act. Um, and it was just, 
all the, the clauses that they depended on for that authority were pretty ambiguous. So they gave themselves the power to do this um, with the 14th Amendment. So we found that the Civil Rights Act was absolutely essential and kind of that was that opened the floodgates for the rest of the things we started to include. Um, the 15th Amendment project um, can rightfully be called the Reconstruction Acts project as well. Um, again, as we were working through the drafting of the, four, the, the 15th Amendment, we found that it was necessary to provide context um, for us to include the Reconstruction Acts. So this project um, does that. Uh, here you can see there's a long list of all of the documents we've included within this project. Um, many of these documents here actually just die. Um, they're never fulfilled, they're never enacted. However, we included them because they had a huge impact on the final versions of each of these major bills that we modeled. So we were really mindful, again, with our selection in this project, we didn't want to overlook those documents that had died because they did, they incorporated a lot of debate, a lot of insight into the final documents, um, even though they eventually just failed. The last project that we have in our group of projects is the Civil Rights Act of 1875. Um, this is actually our largest project. It spans um, over five years and three congressional sessions. So. Um, uh, Senator Charles Sumner tried to start passing the Civil Rights Act um, in 1870, and it took five years, and unfortunately, he died in 1874, so he wasn't able to see um, his dream and his baby come to light, but um, we've modeled each of those congressional sessions. We found it interesting, too, that at one point, after so many failed attempts, um, Charles Sumner tries to actually put the Civil Rights Act provisions onto another unrelated bill um, that had already passed um, the House. So he tries, he has to get creative procedurally. Um, and I think that's a really cool thing that we're, we're able to show within Quill here is how he used kind of the rules of Congress and the procedures to try to get his legislation passed. Um, that attempt failed. Um, but they did pass the Civil Rights Act of 1875 as a standalone bill. Um, we have an interesting story with uh, the committee records here. Um, pretty quickly into our research, we found that we really, really needed those committee records. Um, there was quite a big hole in our research where those records should be. Um, as you can see here, this is the 15th Amendment. This is the text going in to the, um, to the committee, and then here the text coming out of the committee. We have no idea, we had no idea, what happened in that time while that text was in the committee. We don't know who changed the text, how they changed it, so we knew we had to get those records. Unfortunately, none of those records are available in a digital format. Um, they were only available at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. So. Back in December of 2019, we contacted the National Archives and arranged a trip for March 2020. Um, <laughs> that didn't happen. Uh, we thought it would just be a few weeks and then a few months, but we weren't able to get out to the National Archives until March of this year, so two years later. Um, we didn't want to put our research on hold, um, so we had to kind of make some basic assumptions about what happened in these committees in order to push forward with our, our research. Um, so over those two years, we kind of built a lot of expectations about what we would find at the National Archives. Um, we expected there would be some detailed cataloging and filing um, at the National Archives so we could see what exactly we were looking for, how to get it. Um, that wasn't the case. In fact, it was very vague and broad categorizations um, and so we were left with having to dig through about 10 feet of records um, to find what we needed. Uh, we also thought that they would be nicely printed, kind of in a newspaper format. Um, no, all of them are handwritten. 
Um, and if you ever tried to like read your grandma's like cursive, it was about a million times worse than that. So that was very difficult. Um, we also thought that we'd have kind of more thorough, complete record of these committee minutes. Uh, in some cases, in reality, we found they didn't exist at all or had been lost. Um, and the ones that did exist were kind of just short summaries, um, which was a little disappointing. But the records we were able to get, we have incorporated into our research. And as Dr. Cole said, they're the first time that they've been made available publicly in a digital format. So it's really exciting to be able to offer researchers and students um, that new information. Speaking of things that are missing, for instance, there are a lot of missing committee records, unfortunately, that would elucidate much clearer why Northwest Ordinance Language was chosen for the 13th Amendment, which for interested students is also the language that includes like slavery being a possibility under if you are convicted of a crime, right, which is politically relevant today. Unfortunately, those records are missing, as well as all of these records. We couldn't include Friedman's legislation. Things were limited by time, resources, and also just the availability of the records themselves. So these are possibilities for expansion one day. Um, so we're just going to go over some three uh, practical research questions that you can use our platform to ask. Uh, for one, our, our work and our, our body of research really gives an excellent lens to view executive or the separation of powers, executive and legislative tension at this time, specifically on the reconstruction question, but just on about every question. There are presidential messages and there are endless debates in legislature over those presidential messages. As well as because of the way that Quill aggregates the data that we entered, we ended up with some extremely detailed and interactable individual histories. So anybody who was involved in the legislature from 1860 to 1875, you can search through and click to everything that they did on the question of civil rights. I know that the symbols here may be a little confusing, but essentially a really interesting thing we found while doing this is that a lot of rules are broken by Congress themselves. They've set up these procedures by which to pass these um, this legislation, and yet they're breaking their own rules. And um, that kind of sparked the question for us, you know, where do you draw the line? Is it okay um, to break? those rules should something should a document um, like the Civil Rights Act of 1875, it was actually passed while breaking a very significant rule in Congress. So what does that mean for the legality of it, right? Could it be challenged legally because Congress didn't abide by their rules for passing it? Um, there are plenty of examples as we go through um, this reconstruction era legislation and the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, this happens quite often. So um, it's just worth asking, you know, where do you draw the line? Where, how binding should these rules be? What does that mean for the legal um, side of these uh, bills? Um, and we really hope that someone takes up uh, some of these research questions and others that you have. And we really hope that as you look through our projects, they will enhance history for you and be able to bring it to life um, for you like it did for us and will help you engage with it and ask important questions. Thank you. Thank you. We'll get a microphone to everybody sitting down. Thank you. 
This is for um, Erica and Kenya. Is there a website that I can look at your research? So since I'm interested in it. We should have put that on the screen. It's it's quillproject.net. Uh, and uh, we should have put that on the screen. So yes, sorry. Some of the heroes that uh, personally you two came up with while, while you were uh, doing the research that that really made a difference. There are people like Thaddeus Stevens, Charles Sumner, James Ashley. Um, but as I mentioned before, it was tempting to glamorize these people because they were really fighting on the cutting edge of what was a really repressive society. But at the same time, for instance, James Ashley's interest in colonization programs and things like that made us reconsider if it was worth telling a story to ourselves of of a hero's tale at all. Hello, okay. Um, I think that that's a, a hard question to answer. I think there, that Erica pointed out there are clear actors here that were very impactful and um, leading that civil rights um, movement at the time. Um, but at, this, at the same time, I, we also found kind of quieter actors as well. And I think that's where Quill can be really beneficial is as we're looking at these individual um, profiles of actors here, you see that people through their voting records are kind of quiet heroes, if you will, um, where their voting records show they may not be engaging in the debates as much, but their voting is very much in line with um, these more public heroes, if you will. Same line, um, and this may be um, impossible to answer, but with the assassination of President Lincoln, how did that affect the trajectory of civil rights legislation? Violence in general, especially uh, acts of terrorism, really impacted the development of civil rights legislation. That's really visible in our project. There are some places I wish it was more visible. For instance, uh, different riots that were caused in the South during the debate of the 14th Amendment, specifically in Memphis, where unfortunately there was a lot of death and suffering, that that really uh, sped things up in Congress. And uh, they, I would say that the belief that Honestly, it really starts actually in the 13th Amendment with abolition violence. So the question of whether like acts of violence in public affected the legislation starts from the very beginning. And I would say that Congress was really interested in trying to stitch society back together. Um, I also think that with the assassination of um, President Lincoln and um, Andrew Johnson coming in, right, that there's a lot, again, we mentioned briefly the tension between the executive and the legislature at the time, and that is plays very prominently, um, I mean, even leading up to his impeachment. So I think just the act of succession there, right, um, due to Lincoln's assassination, um, just really um, the, our research, the Quill Project really brings out that um, legislative executive tension that existed there. Yeah. Hi, I am a teacher, and I'm wondering how you can use the Quill website to do research. I was looking at it online while you were speaking, and of course, I was on my phone, so it's not a great platform, but I was having a difficult time navigating it to see how would I put my kids on this and say, let's just dig into the laws and the material that's here. Yeah, so you're you're absolutely right to ask that. Um, so, so two answers. One is, um, I think already tracking the behavior of individuals or 
tracking the history of particular phrases. I, I think that's a really exciting um, task that already classrooms are, are, have, have found useful. But over the coming uh, year and two years, we're really going to have a push to create much more curated material for teachers, um, especially working with the center here and with others to, to, to add a kind of curated layer. What you're seeing at the moment is very much the sort of raw, um, sort of empirical research that uh, we've been able to do. And our task now is to make that more uh, usable. So uh, watch this space, but I think already tracing, you know, particular individuals or, or tracing particular phrases can, can be a really exciting um, and interesting sort of task for, for students. Um, but we know that there is work to do in that space. So, so we're on it. Yeah, just, to, just to briefly follow up, that, that yeah, it is, it is a work in, in progress, but I can, as a researcher, I can already see um, specific questions that historians have been dealing with for a while that your, your work is immediately relevant, relevant to, and it's kind of building, uh, Nicholas, on what you were just saying. There are, there are questions that historians often ask about uh, the political position of, of the people in Congress. Were they a radical Republican? Were they a moderate Republican? Were they a conservative Republican? And depending upon the historian's assumptions about that person, they interpret their speeches um, to reflect certain radical principles, you know, or, or something, something along those lines. But what, what we're now able to do, and that what the best historians understand, is that these individuals went through different phases. Um, sometimes they would have a, a radical phase, and sometimes for whatever political reality, they would become, become more moderate. And the ability to follow Thaddeus Stevens, for example, and his, and his voting record, or Jacob Howard, who plays a, a very important role in introducing the 14th Amendment to, to Congress, or John Bingham, or whoever it might be, to actually be able to track their voting record on specific civil rights legislation, I think could help us avoid any number of mistakes um, in making assumptions about these particular historical figures. So I, I think that is an immediate use that historians can, and it would also be something that I could assign my students to, you know, um, tell me about Charles Sumner, you know, tell, tell me about, you know, Rollins or whoever it, it might be, track a particularly important individual and tell me if you think they were a radical throughout this whole period. And I just leave it to the student um, to see if they could investigate and come to their own, their own conclusions. Mate, I think the major benefit of our work for high school students like you is just the ability to interact with the congressional material raw as it is. Uh, that material often speaks for itself. So even in its current form being sort of difficult to sort through, or maybe you don't know where to start, the best places to start are dates of relevance of things you're interested in and names. And reading from there, just getting exposed to the material itself rather than a secondary source, right? That would sort of teach you what somebody else thought of the material. Exposing yourself to the material as it is, I think is educational on its own. We have a question from online. Uh, should, I, should I go first or do we want to let the online people take a turn? All righty. Um, I've heard this from all of you during your uh, talks. You mentioned that uh, opponents of the Reconstruction Acts and uh, you know, the 14th Amendment uh, made the argument that taking away the right to slavery was unconstitutional. What was the substance of that argument? What do those people have to say? I don't know, Claire, do you want to? Uh, the, um, there, there, was a, there was a 70 year debate about that before the Civil War. Um, with, and, and it comes down to what you think the nature of the original compact between the states is. And people took very radical different views on that and projected onto the 1787 constitution, a whole range of different thoughts about what the nature of that compact was, was and who it was for. And there is a horrible range of opinions. Um, but I, I'm, I'm sorry that there isn't a sort of more detailed answer. 
since this is the last question, I just want to say one thing. Um, if you are thinking, if you are at a sort of stage in your education when you're thinking about, do I want to get involved in different projects? Um, the work that the students at the center are doing is, is beyond some PhD level work collectively. Um, what they have been able to do is genuinely research, a word that is often cheapened, but they have genuinely brought to light in a really interesting way things that we just didn't know before or thought we might know but didn't know for sure. And I am in awe of their work and their dedication and it is a huge privilege to continue to work with the students at UVU. So my thanks to all of them. Thank you, Scott. All right. This concludes our first session. So we're gonna have a 15 minute break at 10.50, the second session begins. Um, I just, uh, for our online audience, we'll, we'll, uh, you'll see a countdown or, or some, just tune back in at uh, 10.50. Um, for those here in the room, um, we're gonna, for those, there's a few left over there. We're just gonna drop this curtain and move everybody in. We have, so our, our high school students are here. We're feeding them later, but much later. So we've got a snack for you outside. Uh, there's bags out the back. Um, yeah, I know. Sorry, that sounds so kindergarten. It sounds, we've got some food for you to eat and a drink. Um, so it, it's, you'll go with your teachers. They'll hand it out to you. Teachers, if you can just make sure, I said food and that's it. They're gone. Um, uh, if you could have your students back in here just before 1050 um, and, but sit anywhere, we'll just have this whole area open. So see you in a bit. <laughs>
uh, crucial moments in its history. The college has not been able to put up some of the really monstrous buildings that sometimes uh, uh, grace different bits of Oxford. Uh, we've got this wonderful, wonderful uh, quadrangle in the middle of the college, still a very open and green space for the city. And the Quill Project offices themselves currently sit in a very special corner of the front quad of uh, Pembroke College, which is the, the oldest 
All right, welcome, All right, welcome or welcome, welcome back, back as the case, case may be, may be, 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 be to the to second the session, session, session of the annual, of the annual Constitution, Constitution Day Conference, Day Conference the, Reconstruction the Reconstruction Amendments, Amendments the Roots of Civil roots Rights. Of civil rights. Right. Very, excited Very excited for this, excited for this, this second this session. session. Um, 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 we get to hear get from to two hear from outstanding two presenters, presenters today, today who will today. focus we'll more focus on the question of uh, citizenship on the issue of citizenship uh, as it relates to reconstruction specifically to uh, to the reconstruction era um, of course we trace that to the 14th amendment so to introduce our speakers uh, we have cashlin english we introduced cashlin before so those of you here in the first session uh, for those of you who weren't cashlin is a student here at uvu majoring in philosophy with a minor in constitutional studies she also uh, uh, is the project lead for the Quill Project uh, within the center. So the student project lead for that. So Cashlin will introduce our speakers, and then we'll have we'll have one of them will be appearing online, uh, and then the other will be appearing in person. Thank you, Scott. So Dr. Grace Mallon, who will be our one that we see over Zoom. Dr. Grace Mallon is a Kinder Junior Research Fellow during her postdoc at Oxford's Rothmere American Institute. Her research interests include the history of the US Constitution and government during the period between the American Revolution and the American Civil War. She has been closely involved with the creation of a digital model of the 1787 Constitutional Convention with the Quill Project. Grace, thank you. Give her a virtual round of applause. And then and then joining Grace in this session is Bradley Rivera. He is an associate professor of law at Brigham Young University. His research ranges from US constitutional history to comparative constitutional inquiries. His book manuscript, Natural, Natural Rights, Reconstitution, Frederick Douglass and Constitutional Abolitionism explores the constitutional thought of Frederick Douglass and its influence during Reconstruction. Thank you. Right, I guess that's my cue. Um, oh gosh, and there's my face, um, and it's very big. So, um, welcome everyone. Grace, to the if you yes. can unmute, I'm unmuted. That would be great. We can see you, just can't hear you. I've been unmute. I'm unmuted. Oh, oh now we can hear. Now we we, just, can, heard we you. just heard you. Fantastic. Well, I was. Unmuted. Unmuted. Perfect. Perfect. Um, Perfect. Well, I was just saying, um, welcome everyone to the Let's Examine Grace's Pause in Minute Detail um, session. And that is an alarmingly large um, image of my face that you have there. Um, never mind. Um, I'm terribly pleased to be back in some fashion um, with the Center for Constitutional Studies, which is very dear to my heart. Um, and I'm so thrilled to be part of this amazing event. Um, I greatly enjoyed um, the uh, earlier sessions, um, and I'm just a little bit embarrassed to be in the company of, of such tremendous expert, experts on the Reconstruction era. I am not myself um, an expert on the Reconstruction era, so I'm not going to talk about it, which I hope is all right. Instead, um, I'm going to focus on um, the era of uh, the era preceding Reconstruction um, and try to think about what citizenship might have meant to Americans um, in the era before the 14th Amendment. Um, was was drafted and ratified. Now that might seem like a sort of a funny concern because what does the 14th Amendment do? It tells us who is a US citizen. And it tells us for the first time who is a US citizen. Um, and, and who is a US citizen? A US citizen is someone who is born or naturalized um, in the United States. So that's the first time that US citizenship is actually defined in the constitutional text. So, but people use the idea of citizenship of the United States and refer to it and designate people as being citizens of the United States or not throughout the period um, preceding between the, the American Revolution um, and the Reconstruction era. So what are we to make of how Americans actually defined and conceptualized and experienced citizenship in the period before the 14th Amendment um, actually was uh, drafted and ratified. So that's what I'm going to talk about uh, today. And, uh, I, I, and Bradley Ribeiro is, is a far greater expert on all of these issues than I am. So I'm, I'm, I'm relying on him to correct anything that I may, uh, may get wrong <laughs> in this talk. Um, 
And I think this, this question about how people actually experience citizenship, uh, individual Americans experienced and thought about citizenship and how it actually worked in practice um, is something that, that we can also reflect on today uh, and the different ways that people experience citizenship today. Um, Professor Lash, uh, in his wonderful talk, mentioned um, the case of Dred Scott versus Sandford. Um, and I'm going to begin there um, in my talk, not because it's the chronological beginning of the story that I want to tell, but because the arguments made and the opinions expressed during that case posed some very difficult and important questions about what US citizenship actually meant to Americans before the Civil War. So obviously Dred Scott versus Sandford um, was, a, was a sort of crucial case um, that, that arose, it was a Supreme Court case that arose out of a freedom suit um, by a black man uh, from Missouri, his name was Dred Scott, um, and he, he um, argued that he was in fact a free man because he had traveled uh, and lived in a free state. And so um, there were a lot of arguments and, and questions that were being posed during that case about, you know, what is Congress's right to govern slavery in the territories, which we've already heard um, plenty of about. Um, but uh, the Chief Justice of the United States, Roger Tawney, took it even beyond that question about whether Dred Scott was a free man or whether, uh, whether his, his sojourn in Illinois, his time uh, in a free state, made him um, a free man and, and how that might have affected uh, Congress's right to regulate um, slavery in the territories. He wanted to solve a whole raft of other political issues um, through his judgment in this case. Um, and he ended up making some rather troubling, um, but rather interesting arguments about US citizenship in the process. For our purposes, the most important of these is his ruling that, I quote, a free Negro of the African race whose ancestors were brought to this country and sold as slaves is not a citizen within the meaning of the Constitution of the United States. As a result, regardless of whether Dred Scott was a free man, as he claimed, or an enslaved person, he was, I quote, not entitled to sue in a court of the United States. Tawney supported this ruling in the case of Dred Scott with the argument that, that, that at the time of the framing and ratification of the US Constitution, no state in the Union had recognized people of African descent as citizens. Therefore, despite the fact that some states might now recognize Black people as citizens, which is to say certain Northern states, these people, Black people, did not qualify for national citizenship, which is to say they were not, in the language of the Constitution, guaranteed all privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states, which is one of only a couple of places in the, in the antebellum Constitution where the term citizen is actually used. So they weren't guaranteed those privileges and immunities. The Privileges and Immunities Clause of the Constitution did apply to white people, according to Chief Justice Tawney, because they had been intended to be considered citizens in 1787, but it did not apply to black people. That was his argument. To follow Tawney's reasoning around who was and was not a national citizen clearly took quite a bit of mental gymnastics. It's not a very easy ruling to follow. It also seemed to be factually inaccurate as the two justices who dissented in the case, John McLean and Benjamin Robbins Curtis both argued. In his excoriating response to Chief Justice Tawney, Justice Curtis pointed out that, quote, at the time of the ratification of the Articles of Confederation, the first constitution of the United States, all free native born inhabitants of the states of New Hampshire, Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, and North Carolina, though descended from African slaves, were not only citizens of those states, but such of them has, as had other necessary qualifications, which is to say being male freeholders or taxpayers or heads of household over the age of about 21, possessed the franchise of electors on equal terms with other citizens. That is to say, not only were some, not only were black people citizens in those states, but some black people in those states even had the right to vote. Well, this was a powerful point. His colleague just Justice McLean also noted that for a man to constitute a citizen, quote, it has never been held necessary that he should have the qualifications of an elector, 
females and minors, he wrote, were also considered to be citizens for the purposes of suing in federal court, despite the fact that they could not legally vote or hold office. So we have an interesting distinction here. We have a question being posed about whether to be considered a full citizen, you need to possess what we could call political rights, particularly the right to vote. So having the right to vote is obviously very important to American citizens today, but obviously there were a lot of people in the 19th century, particularly women, who didn't have the right to vote. Were they still citizens? And McLean is, is trying to make that point. A colleague of mine named Derek Litvak, who's currently completing his doctorate at the University of Maryland, studies the question of black citizenship in the early Republic. And in his work, he makes a very provocative point. He says, we all like to read Curtis's and McLean's dissents in the case of Dred Scott, because they feel moral. They're telling a story about equality, about how equality is the heart of American history and the history of American citizenship. But Litvak also asks, what if Chief Justice Tawney's characterization of the nature of black rights and citizenship in the early Republic, as dark as it is, was actually closer to the truth? Because what kind of extraordinarily limited definition of citizenship must we have in mind if we believe that black people, even free black people, experienced citizenship in the decades before the Civil War? The question that the opinions in Dred Scott posed, that Litvak amplifies in his work, is the question of what we should understand to be the rights that were associated with citizenship in the early Republic before any clear definition of it existed. To support his argument that black people were not seen as citizens even in Northern states at the time of the American founding, Chief Justice Tawney went back into the statute books of the British colonies and the early states it's to dig up some of the laws that placed black people, as they would say in the 19th century, under a disability or that discriminated against them and limited their rights by comparison with white people. Tawney noted, for example, quote, that intermarriages between white persons and Negroes or mulattoes were regarded as unnatural and immoral and punished as crimes, end quote. He added that it didn't matter whether the black person involved was free or enslaved, quote, this stigma of the deepest degradation was fixed upon the whole race. Beyond this marriage question, black people face many other kinds of discriminatory laws and practices in the free North, which waxed and waned in different places at different times across the first half of the 19th century. These included prohibitions on black children attending public schools and black people testifying in court in cases involving whites. I think one of the most powerful indications of the difficulties that even free Northern Black people experienced before the Civil War is the limits to their freedom of movement that were widely enforced across the so-called free states. It's particularly striking because when we look at the history of the formation of the US Constitution back in the 1780s, we have to note that establishing freedom of movement of people and goods across the internal borders of the Union was kind of a key feature of the constitutional revolution that took place in that period. We also have to turn once again to that privileges and immunities clause of the constitution, which suggests that it was supposed to support the freedom of movement across state boundaries. We might also think about your own expectations of American citizenship today. If you were born or naturalized in the United States and considered yourself a good law abiding citizen, you would be pretty surprised to find yourself faced with some pretty insurmountable legal obstacles to moving from say, Utah County to Salt Lake County, or from Utah to Nevada or the like. But those were the kinds of challenges that some 19th century Americans faced. In the 18th and 19th centuries, there existed a network of regulations across different states and localities that were designed to limit the freedom of movement of particular classes of people, whether they'd been born in the United States or not. These regulations were offshoots of an English system dating back at least to the reign of Elizabeth I in the 16th century. This system was called the Poor Law. Because there was no centralized national welfare system in early modern England, local governments were assigned the task of supporting people who, for whatever reason, were unable to financially support themselves. Like today, these local governments and many of their residents did not necessarily approach this task in the spirit of Christian charity. 
They were particularly concerned about the idea that impoverished people were wandering far away from home and imposing their needs on distant communities. The law therefore provided that people who were unable to make their own living and were not legal dependents, so that's wives or children or servants, of someone who could support them, could be removed back to the place they'd originally come from or where they were considered to be legally settled. So if you moved somewhere away from home and you struggled to find employment or you lost your job or you couldn't find wealthy members of the community to vouch for you and support you, you could essentially be deported from one part of the country to another. This legal tradition survived not only a transatlantic crossing in the 17th century, but also the American Revolution and the ratification of the US Constitution in the late 18th century. In the new United States too, it was understood to be the right of state governments to regulate their own internal police, which is to say the welfare and safety of all their inhabitants by almost any means necessary. That's a lot of different kinds of powers. State and local governments perceive the poor, people of color and immigrants as particularly troublesome subgroups whose movements should be closely monitored and regulated. So let's imagine a free black man living in Virginia in the early 19th century. He's either been free since birth or perhaps he gained his freedom through manumission or other means. And he's heard that Ohio, where slavery is illegal, is a better place to live as a free black person than the slave society of Virginia. So he decides to move to Ohio. Before he leaves, he's going to make sure that he has his papers in order. I think this is quite interesting because there's been a lot of talk about papers in relation to vaccination passports and so on. So getting hold of his papers is a bit of a process. It's almost like getting a visa or a passport and bearing in mind he's only moving within the United States. Our, our traveler has to visit the county clerk where he lives to get papers certifying his freedom. He then has these papers authenticated by a justice of the peace, who also issues a pass with his name and physical description that will allow him to prove his freedom to slave patrols and other law enforcement officials whose job it is to regulate racial hierarchy in Virginia. When our traveller makes his way up to Ohio, he goes to the clerk of the county where he plans to settle to present his papers. Now, despite the fact that Ohio does not permit slavery, it has laws in place that actively discriminate against African-Americans, just as Chief Justice Tawney suggested. So Professor Lash mentioned black codes in the period after the Civil War. These are already in existence before the Civil War, and they're in existence in the North as well as in the South, essentially regulating African-Americans and discriminating against them as a separate class. In order for our traveler to settle legally in this county in Ohio that he's turned up in, he's going to have to get two local landowners to pledge to pay up to $500, which is a lot of money in the early 19th century, to support him in case he can't find work and becomes a burden on the local welfare infrastructure. In other places, all free black people would have to carry papers that demonstrated that they were employed by a white person locally, which was supposed to serve a similar purpose. So that's the North. Obviously in the Southern states where slavery dominated both the economy and society, the free movement of free black people was understood to be a particular threat. Black people traveling from the supposedly liberal North might given the opportunity, attempt to foment rebellion among the large enslaved populations of these southern states. In 1822, in response to this, South Carolina's state legislature passed a law providing that all free black sailors passing through the ports of the state were liable to be held in jail between the arrival and departure of their vessels. So bearing in mind they haven't committed a crime and uh, they are legally free where they come from, but they have to be held in jail while they're in Charleston or in South Carolina. When Charleston officials attempted to enforce the law, it caused uproar among Northern shipmasters traveling with black mariners. And the situation only escalated when South Carolina attempted to arrest foreign black mariners, including a black British sailor. In South Carolina and elsewhere in the South, black sailors risked being identified as runaway slaves, captured and sold. The mariners posed a particularly difficult constitutional problem in the early Republic. 
The Southern states insisted that because they had the right to regulate their own internal police and particularly slavery, they should be allowed to control who was and was not afforded the right to come and go at will within their boundaries. They already regulated quarantine for incoming shipping, which limited freedom of movement, and they even regulated foreign immigration, which we'll return to in a moment. So why shouldn't they regulate black sailors who were traveling into the state? But here's the rub. The federal government had already gestured toward the federal citizenship of black mariners by issuing them from the 1790s with certificates identifying them as citizens of the United States for the purpose of their interactions with foreign sailors and governments when they were out at sea. And northern states like Massachusetts protested that their own citizens were being discriminated against in an unconstitutional manner because Massachusetts recognized the citizenship of black people. While the antebellum Congress never acted to curtail the activities of southern states in this regard, the matter generated considerable public controversy, which Kate Mesa and Michael Schopner have both written about quite brilliantly. So the point here is that the free movement of free black people, along with many of their other civil and political rights were so restricted and contested that their citizenship was fragile, tenuous and contingent, even within so-called free states in the North. So too, though not to the same extent, was the citizenship of other people who were considered threatening to the community, especially the poor, whose freedom was also often at risk from similar kinds of laws to those that were used to target free African-Americans, especially vagrancy laws. All of this means that before the 14th Amendment, the extent of state and local control meant that people's experiences of citizenship could vary wildly depending on place, race, and class. I also want to touch on the ways in which people's access to citizenship could vary depending on the decision of local authorities. And by people in this case, I mean especially immigrants. Some very fascinating recent work by historians and political scientists has sought to explore how immigration was regulated before the federal government formally took the reins through the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act. Although the federal government passed laws regulating naturalization, that is the legal process by which an immigrant becomes a citizen from the 1790s onwards, it did not take over the regulation of who would and would not actually be admitted into the United States until some time after the Civil War. Instead, states regulated immigration and they regulated it on the basis of the same kinds of concerns that motivated their regulation of free African-Americans and their movement. We have to bear in mind, of course, to be naturalized in the United States, you have to live in the United States for a certain amount of time. So immigration regulation is naturally an extension of sort of the regulation of citizenship and who gets to be a citizen. Southern slave societies, for obvious reasons, wanted to retain control of immigration so they could prevent the further influx of free black people who might bring with them dangerous beliefs about racial equality and black rights. What's almost more interesting, though, is the case of the northern states and their immigration regulation. Northerners were plenty racist, too, as Erica and Kiana have pointed out, but their overriding concern was with the poverty of immigrants and subsidiary issues surrounding the religion and morality of particular immigrant populations. States like New York and Massachusetts passed expansive immigration laws in the 19th century to try and ensure that only the right kind of people would enter their territories and have the opportunity to settle there long term. These laws tried to discourage ships captains from importing people who might become a public charge that is dependent on the public welfare. By holding these captains financially responsible for the immigrants who disembarked their vessels in New York or Boston. The states imposed lengthy periods of quarantine on new immigrants and actually reserved the right to deport migrants to their place of origin if they were found to be sick, mentally or physically disabled, or known or thought to have been dependent on public charity back in Europe, i.e. they'd been unemployed or whatever. Stereotypes about poverty, Catholicism and alcoholism contributed to the narratives that justified these laws, especially in the case of immigrants from Ireland and Germany. In his book, Expelling the Poor, UC Berkeley historian Hidetaka Hirota shows that, I quote, between the 1830s and the early 1880s, which is to say after the 14th Amendment had been ratified, at least 50,000 people were removed from Massachusetts alone under the authority, not of the federal government, but of the state. In fact, Massachusetts actually deported to Ireland some American citizens of Irish descent 
because those people were dependent on public charity. So these states made really significant choices about who would have the opportunity to settle in the United States and to become citizens or produce American born children who would be naturally citizens. They also denied people who were by any standard legally citizens of the United States the rights of citizenship by actually removing them to another country. As I've described above, the states also participated in deporting American-born inhabitants to other parts of the country if they became dependent on welfare, and they imposed harsh regulations on free African Americans in the belief that they were more likely than whites to become reliant on public charity. Moreover, these kinds of regulations did not become history with Reconstruction, the end of the Civil War. Vagrancy laws restricting freedom of movement became crucial to Southern efforts to build Jim Crow during and after Reconstruction. States continued to regulate, regulate migration even after the Civil War, and the Chinese Exclusion Act was modeled on pre-existing state policies and enforced by state officials. What I want to draw out of all of this is that who would and would not be admitted to citizenship and who was and was not allowed to enjoy the full extent of the freedoms we might expect American citizenship to offer was a highly complex and contingent matter in the 19th century, both before and after the ratification of the 14th Amendment. And a lot of that was to do with this question of federalism um, that Professor Lash mentioned earlier and that I'm personally very interested in. Not only race and class, but also gender severely affected how people experienced citizenship in this period. While black people and white people, men and women, all at different times claimed or were claimed to be American citizens, there was a clear and substantial difference in the political and civil rights that this claimed status conferred on each of these categories of American. And where and in what contexts their citizenship would be counted as valid. So place is really important. I think while many of the explicit legal restrictions on rights have fallen away over time, this idea that citizenship is experienced differently depending on things like place, race, class, and gender is still worth considering in our current context. What is fascinating and inspiring though, to end on a positive note, is that the idea of American citizenship, even though it was really vaguely defined, there was no definition really at all, held so much promise to all these different groups of people in the antebellum period. Having their claims to citizenship accepted, especially with the passage of the 14th Amendment, would become the baseline for further claims about the rights that citizenship should allow them to enjoy in the United States. Thank you all very much for listening, and uh, I'm looking forward to your questions. <laughs>
the same the population. Same population, same population, same population, same population. Same Poor decision. Poor conclusion. Conclusion. Right to vote was also a duty that all citizens of a democratic society held. You did not simply have the privilege to vote, but you were obliged to participate politically, to vote in a manner that would promote the common good. Now, what's been, what will follow is an account of Douglas's fight for black suffrage during Reconstruction and how voting uh, and how viewing voting as a duty was integral to Douglas's advocacy for the 15th Amendment. Now, Douglas, Frederick Douglass, the man, uh, he lived a remarkable life. If you haven't yet, please read his uh, personal narr narrative, My Bondage and My Freedom. Uh, I, I promise you, you'll look at not only the history of the U.S., but also its promises differently after reading this. Uh, he, was, he was born as a slave. He was born into slavery, um, but eventually gained his freedom. So from a former slave, he turned activist as a prominent abolitionist in the uh, antebellum era and eventually turned a statesman in the Reconstruction era. And for this address, I'm going to mostly focus on Frederick Douglass, the statesman. As the Civil War drew to a close and the North looked to be victor, Congress set its sights on bringing the emancipation to its next natural step in its evolution the complete abolition of slavery. Having, having freed slaves in the rebel states by decree, the time had now come to secure uh, the freedom of all U.S. inhabitants uh, by constitutional amendment. And the 13th Amendment did just that. It ensured the basic liberty of all individuals in the U.S. But now that the former slaves were free, the work had only just begun. And the next natural step in that progression in respecting all persons' human dignity was to secure their civil rights, allowing them to take their place as equal citizens in the Union. Now, during this time, Douglas energetically supported the 13th Amendment, calling on the nation to secure explicitly what he always thought the Constitution implicitly held, 
that men were born with certain inalienable rights, and these rights required that they be free. But when they turned their sights to civil rights, Douglas remained fixated on political rights. In fact, during the fierce debates in Congress over the public and the public over the 14th Amendment, the amendment that would secure the civil rights of U.S. citizens, we find that Douglas was largely dismissive of the entire debate. Now, this is surprising given the importance of the 14th Amendment at the time. After all, it overturned Dred Scott, which you've already learned about today. It put beyond question the fact that freedmen were indeed citizens and that they, in fact, did have rights that white men were bound to respect. But Douglas's dialogues or Douglas's contributions to dialogues concerning the 14th Amendment were generally limited to one observation that the 14th Amendment simply was not enough. It was deficient for one reason and one reason only. It did not grant blacks equal political rights. Well before Appomattox, suffrage was of great concern to Douglas and it preoccupied nearly all of his efforts during Reconstruction. Now, you might find this a little curious. After all, one might assume that a nation that's poised not only to free all slaves, but eager to secure their most basic civil rights against encroachment from former slave masters, that they would embrace the opportunity to ensure that those slaves became equal participants through equal voting rights in the newly reconstructed republic. Now, while, while this might have been true of many, there were still many others that were adamant that Blacks be secured in this civil rights, but no more. We must understand this context, after all, because um, it's going to help illuminate Douglas's understanding of the nature of voting, but also help us discern why Douglas's arguments took the shape that they did at that time. So we find throughout Reconstruction that Douglas made a variety of arguments for why Blacks not only deserved, but needed the right to vote. His arguments were <clears throat> in many ways informed and shaped by the principal opposition uh, to the right to vote, which might have been said to have come from largely two different sources. One source of opposition uh, to black suffrage came from general apathy, those who felt that the union simply had done enough for blacks uh, in setting them free. Perhaps blacks could be granted the right to vote in the future, but the time simply was not yet ripe. The nation needed time to heal from its wounds before any more social upheavals. What was more, most Blacks were not even ready to vote. They needed to learn how to be free, how to work and labor for their own fortune before they sought other privileges of citizenship. Another source of opposition, equally formidable, if not more damaging to the Black suffrage movement was the opposition posed by women suffragists. Led by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, these women, once allies in the abolitionist movement uh, found the prospect of black suffrage without granting women suffrage at the same time to be simply unpalatable. But what started out as arguments to include women's suffrage in short order became arguments to outright block black suffrage. Now, Douglas experienced firsthand the dark specter of apathy uh, and reluctance to grant black suffrage at the hands of President Andrew Johnson. Abraham Lincoln's successor. Not long after Johnson took office, Douglas visited him with a Black delegation in hopes of securing his support for Black suffrage. But Johnson admonished them for their general lack of gratitude for what already had been achieved, even cutting Douglas off, curtly telling Douglas and the delegation that they failed to fully appreciate what had already been accomplished for Blacks. What is more, even if there were public support for black suffrage, Johnson argued it simply was not prudent to grant them suffrage at that time. In the future, perhaps yes, but certainly not then. Now Johnson's hesitancy on the one hand and outright opposition on the other reflected the general political sense at the time. Some opposed uh, black suffrage for a variety of reasons based on prejudice, fear, or simple and overall concern for uh, political stability. In other words, some people just thought it was too much change too fast. Where we freed nearly 4 million people, granting them the right to vote would simply change the entire fabric of the American Union. And it was too much, at least at that time. Now, perhaps most surprisingly to Douglas, however, was the opposition he faced from an unexpected corner. 
During the antebellum period, as mentioned earlier, abolitionists and women's rights advocates shared similar goals. Both sought to bring into stark reality the hypocrisy of a nation that touted the Declaration of Independence as its lodestar, yet enslaved millions. If all men were created equal, then why were some 4 million persons enslaved and nearly half the population denied basic civil rights, most important among them the right to vote? Douglas at this time was a strong advocate for women's suffrage in the late antebellum era, and many women leaders ceaselessly called for abolition, even as they sought equal rights for themselves. Douglas, Stanton, and Anthony were close friends and equally supported each other in their efforts. There was a real sense that injustice for some was truly injustice for all. But Reconstruction, unfortunately, brought a rift in this once strong alliance. Elizabeth Stanton and Susan B. Anthony combined with Democrats to push women's suffrage. Democrats, they would int introduce uh, petitions from women's suffrage advocates into conference, generally as an effort to derail calls for black suffrage. These Democrats argued, if we're to extend anyone the right to vote, it should be to women. After all, they are more fit to vote. Women in turn began championing the slogan, educated suffrage. Recently, freed men were simply unfit to vote. They were denied an education while enslaved, which although sad, it made it so that they could not possibly be expected to make informed decisions in elections. They couldn't even read. How could we possibly expect them to actually make good decisions? Now, this friction in this regard came to a head in the Equal Rights Convention of 1869, which uh, Professor Lash mentioned earlier. Anthony claimed that if the right was to be given to anyone, uh, the nation ought to, quote, give it to the most intelligent first, end quote. Now, Douglas responded, reminding all at the convention of the precarious nature and situation of Blacks in the South. For Blacks in the South, the idea of voting wasn't simply a matter of right, but it was a matter of need. Literally, if they don't have the right to vote, then it might actually lead to their death. It's either we get to vote or we die. That was Douglas's mentality. And after this, and what might be seen as a, uh, a move of reconciliation, Douglas proposed that women's suffrage uh, be pursued after black suffrage was secured. And to this, Anthony responded, quote, we are in a fight today, end quote. Stanton and Anthony further peddled the theory that black suffrage would actually be a danger to women. If black males were granted the right to vote, women would suffer under even more oppression. This theory, though short-sighted in many ways, it might not have been entirely unfounded. After all, many who advocated for black suffrage argued that whites should grant it because suffrage was a manly endeavor. Blacks had proved their manliness in the war and to deny them voting rights was cowardly. A real man would not be worried about Blacks voting. Employing this rhetoric of manliness only served to stoke the fear of women's rights advocates. In women's minds, Black men wanted the right to vote so that they could simply join white men in oppressing their women counterparts. It was in this context, fraught with tension, that Douglas needed to make the case for Black suffrage. One thing he knew was that he would need something more than just claiming that Blacks had a right to vote. After all, women also believed that they had a right to vote. And white men believed even if Blacks had a right to vote, Blacks were simply not prepared to vote and were better served focusing on gaining employment and making a new life in their newfound freedom. So Douglas would eventually arrive at the conclusion, uh, would arrive at a conclusion that would answer the contention of opponents but also carry the question of voting beyond this question of privilege or rights alone. Douglas would argue that voting was ultimately a duty that blacks had to fulfill and a duty and whites had a duty to grant them uh, that right to vote. To be sure, Douglas believed that a proper understanding of human beings natural rights provided a sound basis for providing universal suffrage. All human beings, were endowed with certain natural powers. Most important among them 
being the moral capacity to choose between right and wrong and the intellectual ability to discern between the two. What was more, the state of nature evinced the naturalness of community and obligation. We did not exist as atomistic, isolated beings in nature. Rather, we were fundamentally social in nature and entered into the social compact or entered into government to mutually assure one another's rights. Thus, we are naturally bound to each other, creating a mutual obligation to govern and be governed. But one might still ask, what exactly established this duty and to whom was it owed? Again, Douglas argues that governments, they're instituted to protect the natural rights of the community which governed it. In return, the community promised to fulfill certain obligations or duties to further the common good of the state. The key word here for Douglas was citizens or citizenship. The marker that designated an individual a part of a very specific political community. Claiming citizenship, sorry, claiming citizenship granted the individual certain protections, but also carried certain duties that the citizen had to fulfill. The principal duty among these being allegiance to the community. This allegiance was displayed in many ways, including fighting for the community against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Blacks achieved just this in the Civil War. Throughout the Civil War, Douglas implored Abraham Lincoln to employ Blacks in the war effort. He always quipped, why are we fighting with one hand in front and one hand tied behind our backs? Why not employ Blacks in the war effort? Douglas was adamant about getting Blacks to participate because he thought it would bring the war to a decisive conclusion in favor of the North. But more importantly, it would put Blacks' claim to citizenship beyond reproach. Unsurprisingly, when the Union finally permitted Blacks to join the war effort, Douglas fo focused much of his energy, convincing them to join the fight. And join they did. Now Blacks had proven beyond a doubt that their allegiance belonged to the Union, that the fate of the Union and that of Blacks were inextricably intertwined. Now, concerning these duties, many at the time would actually agree with Douglas that, uh, that duties were those obligations specifically held by citizens or official members of the political community. Citizens did have an obligation to, for instance, uphold the laws of the community in which they resided and when the time came to it to take up arms in defense of that community. But Douglas added this third obligation to participate in the political process. Just as the first two obligations were associated with providing stability and safety to the country, so too <clears throat> could the community remain secure only if a substantial majority, if not all, of the community exercised their political rights. Douglas made the case uh, for why it was not only in the interest of Blacks, but also whites that Blacks exercise the right to vote, making three major points. First, all in the community had an interest in preserving the rule of law and maintaining a safe community. This, after all, was the purpose of leaving the state of nature for political society. Though the Civil War had ended, civil rest and injustices continued to abound. Douglas continually to try to impress on white Northerners the precarious nature of Blacks in the South. Black codes and the like demonstrated that though slavery had ended nominally, it still very much remained a reality for most Blacks in the South. Anything short of granting Blacks the right to suffrage was to leave their future to fortune. The hard-fought gains of the Civil War would have been for naught. Indeed, when differentiating Black claims to the right to vote from women, Douglas again constantly repeated that though voting was a matter of rights, for Blacks it was also a matter of life and death. And inasmuch as the community shared a, same, a similar fate, the plight of Blacks was in fact the plight of all. Second, and, close, and a close companion to the first, for Reconstruction to be successful, Blacks needed the right to vote. White Northerners risked a second war in reopening old wounds if they did not grant equal suffrage. White Northerners, uh, sorry, Douglas pointed to the Reconstruction Acts, for instance, 
as evidence of this, when Blacks were granted the right to vote in former Southern states now turned military districts, equitable and progressive constitutions and elections abounded. What was more, Northerners interested, uh, Northern, Northerners' interests were furthered as Blacks came out in droves in favor of, Repub for instance, Republican presidential nominee Ulysses S. Grant. Blacks had provided, uh, had proved to be a viable force for achieving aims of reconstruction. And there was some evidence to suggest that uh, Douglas wasn't just blowing smoke. Grant, after all, the Republican nominee, actually may not have won the pop popular election, but for Blacks. Uh, he beat Richard, Richard Seymour by about 300,000 votes and about 450,000 votes for Grant actually came from Blacks. So for white Northerners, at least, Douglas believed that this created an obligation to see to it that Blacks not only had the right to vote, but that they were effectively able to exercise that, rate, that right in favor of stability and the union. Now, while the first two could be simply construed as a duty that citizens had to ensure others could vote, the last reason fell squarely on the shoulders of each citizen individually. Voting, Douglas argued, was an educative endeavor. This was in response to those who denigrated black suffrage in favor of educated suffrage. Being granted the right to vote placed a certain esteem from the community upon the individual. Each individual in turn needed to be worthy of said esteem, causing them to educate themselves on all pertinent political matters uh, so that they might exercise good judgment when they vote. Thus, the general populace would naturally elevate itself as the responsibility of voting, uh, sorry, the responsibility of ruling and being ruled became a reality for each and every person. Conversely, no voting rights led to less desire to improve and individuals were more likely to be a burden rather than a benefit to society. Therefore, the citizen that contributed to the common good would permit others to vote and ensure that they themselves voted. And ultimately, Douglas's efforts were rewarded with the ratification of the 15th Amendment, which reads, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous servitude, previous condition of servitude. In Douglas's own words, quote, henceforth, we live in a new world, breathe a new atmosphere, have a new earth beneath and a new sky above us. We were always men. Now we are citizens and men among men, end quote. So that leaves us with this question. What might Douglas's understanding of voting mean for us today? In one sense, it certainly would mean that most, if not all citizens should be permitted to vote. Each citizen benefits from ensuring that other citizens are able to exercise their right to vote. This promotes allegiance to the community stability in the rule of law, and ensures the common good. On the other hand, each citizen has a solemn duty to ensure that they exercise their right to vote. And human beings being what they are, those who have the right to vote and are aware that their fellow citizens expect them to exercise that right, will more likely seek to educate themselves on the relevant facts and make informed decisions. This in turn will better promote general prosperity among citizens and ensure that wise leaders and policies are chosen. Hiding in the shadows and simultaneously building apathy and resentment toward the regime would no longer be an option, or at the very least, much less likely. Thus, if we imbibe Douglas's spirit of voting, we too might be able to live in a new world, breathe a new atmosphere, and have a new earth beneath and a new sky above us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ribeiro. Um, okay, so we've got time for questions. We've got a lot of time for questions. So I hope you've been, been taking notes. Um, uh, we, and then we invite also those who may be viewing online to submit, uh, to submit them through the YouTube chat function. Is that how they're submitting? Okay, so for those of you who are online and want to ask questions, email your questions to constitution at uvu. Dot edu. All right, please. <laughs> 
Uh, my question is for both Grace Mallon and Bradley Rivero. My question is that in our research, we found that fear of retribution really was a catalyst for abolition and for the 14th Amendment, in that there was a fear that like there would just be uprising in relation to oppression that was faced in the system. And so my question is to Grace is how do you think fear of retribution affected uh, freedom of movements specifically? And then my question for Bradley is uh, specifically what you discussed regarding paternal narratives that if we gave these people the right to vote that they wouldn't make correct choices for the common good. Do you think that fear of retribution affected that thought? And if so, how? Shall I jump in? Can everyone hear me? Yes, terrific. Um, Erica, thank you for your uh, question. Um, I think you've already sort of got to a lot of, when you were talking about colonization and you were talking, I mean, because if we're, if we're looking at the period before the, before the Civil War, absolutely. I mean, the fear of retribution is a governing principle um, across the Southern states, without a doubt, and particularly after the Haitian Revolution in the 1790s, which shows that a black uprising could be, um, well, you could overthrow a colonial society um, and a, a, an uprising of enslaved people could actually overthrow a colonial society, then um, there is absolute terror. And, and it certainly governs freedom of movement in a very serious way, particularly because I think something we often forget about Haiti um, is we know that a lot of people who fled Haiti after the revolution were white slave owners. And many of them tried to enter the United States or they went to Cuba. Um, but there were also people of free people of color who left Haiti and tried to immigrate to the United States. Um, and there were various instances of free people of color trying to enter the United States. And there was an absolute terror um, that people coming from um, from Haiti um, or would 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 sort of bring with them. Um, principles um, that, that, that were sort of geared towards a race war. And there's actually a really wonderful book um, by a historian called K. Wright Lewis, um, which is called A Curse Upon the Nation. And it considers the idea that the, that the principle of race war um, was, or the idea of the fear of a race war was, a, again, just a very prevalent in antebellum, uh, in the antebellum United States. Um, and uh, that was a lot of what was sort of driving um, this attempt to limit um, freedom of movement among black people um, in both, uh, I mean, particularly in the South. Um, but, but as you mentioned, also in the North, in the sense that there was this, this sense that, um, you know, black and white people cannot coexist um, in freedom. With the right, with to the right. There it is. 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 There
as soon as they're granted freedom, they're granted even just the smallest leeway in pursuing their own uh, uh, employment opportunities. They're given some land in some instances, and they're simply flourishing with the little that they have. And I think it actually impressed a lot of them. And in fact, a lot of the constitutions, for instance, that are adopted by these southern states where blacks are voting are very progressive. Uh, they're very equitable. And in some ways, they actually surpass northern constitutions. And I think this all actually ultimately impresses um, white northerners. And this, this is my current theory that this is also what sort of leads them to adopt black suffrage, or at least uh, find it more palatable, seeing that these apparently uh, ignorant, uh, recently freed men, well, actually, we give them just a couple years, and they're already flourishing. Uh, I think just like in the Civil War, where they impress many of their peers through their fighting, I think also simply through their work ethic, and as, as well as their ability to actually adopt sound policies. I think this also impressed many in the North. Hello, I have actually a question comment thing. Um, we had talked about heroes in the uh, earlier session. And uh, as I was thinking about Frederick Douglass, I mean, don't consider him a hero of that era. And I'm curious as to what uh, Grace, as well as you and Erica and Kiana think of that. If we were to find a hero in, this, in the work that, at the antebellum period. I shall have a go. Is it going to work now? Yes, yes. Um, thank you for that question. Um, I think um, my my latest, some of the reading that I was doing to prepare for this talk, um, I'm not really an expert on the history of citizenship. Um, and I, I, I Bradley knows that I've been reading this book. I've been reading this book by Kate Mazer called Until Justice Be Done. Um, and it's about um, the first, what she calls the first civil rights movement in the United States. And um, essentially she's talking about a coalition of um, black and white activists um, throughout the period from the ratification of the constitution, pretty much um, certainly from sort of the, the breaking up of the Northwest Territory into states um, through to the civil war and reconstruction itself. And she's basically talking about how um, the, 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 the fights that they have and the arguments that they have amongst themselves about what do we want from citizenship? What, what, do, what do black rights even mean? What would happen after freedom? Um, which obviously, you know, pro-slavery folks are often sort of going around saying, we don't know what's going to happen if we just free all of these people. But of course, these activists are actually consciously trying to craft policies about that. Then they're actually dealing with this question in the northern states where abolition is being implemented and gradual abolition and, and sometimes complete abolition are being implemented. And um, so those would probably be my heroes. Another um, thing that might be of interest um, is there's a, a really fascinating um, movement called the Coloured Conventions Movement. Um, which uh, kind of um, coexists with or is interlinked with all of these activists that Kate Mazur is talking about. There's a great digital project. If you're a teacher, um, there's a great digital project that's been produced at Penn State University um, that, uh, that looks at the Coloured Conventions movement. And it's essentially group policy making among African Americans, both before and after the Civil War, and Frederick Douglass is involved with the Colored Convention movement as well. So it's sort of a broader body of people who are doing that kind of work. Question, it's a fraught one. I mean, especially in our time when we're re-examining many historical figures. Um, and in some respects, you could re-examine Douglass in some respects. So for instance, I mean, we always paint a wonderful picture of Douglas, and I think rightfully so. Does it change our perception of him when, let's say, we learn that uh, Douglas, in order to promote black citizenship, uh, always tried to juxtapose blacks from American Indians and mentioning how Indians were simply incapable of assimilating into American society. And this is what differentiated blacks and what made them sort of equal parts to whites as opposed to Indians. Does that change our perception of him? Um, the way that I 
think it ought we ought to consider these things is we often like to impose our own let's say 2022 lens upon the past um but we forget that let's say being prudent or what makes a hero a hero is doing what's necessary at the time in which it needed to be done to ensure that progress towards justice is achieved right another way we might put this is someone who's prudent or who is able to achieve the politically possible at the moment in time and in this sense i why i think douglas is perhaps the greatest statesman that the us has ever had is because i don't think anyone was able to let's say move or advance justice uh, in the way that he could at the time and and just to show why even he had to make difficult decisions again this friction between black suffrage and women's suffrage uh, before the civil war comes to a close he has this interesting article where he says now's the time for us to seize the opportunity to secure the rights of all and he mentions that if we don't if we don't seize this chance right now we might not have another chance in maybe 50 or 100 years. And it was rather prescient that he said this uh, because what happens with women's rights? We don't actually get there for almost another 50 years. But nevertheless, while pushing for black suffrage, he decides to set aside women's suffrage. And in his mind, he thinks, and rightfully so, if I table this, we, not, we might not be able to get women's suffrage for another 50 years. But I think he understands at the time uh, he has to achieve what is simply politically possible. And sure enough, right after the 15th Amendment is adopted, right after it's ratified, his very next article in the newspaper is what? The claims for women and having the equal rights to vote. So he's right back on that train, right? But nevertheless, he had to make a difficult decision. And sure, we can indict him for making that decision. Um, but sometimes it might be more helpful to judge these figures in the past according to the terms in which they had to deal with. And in that sense, Douglas was certainly a hero. And uh, as Dr. Mallon said, I think we can find several others. I hate to go backward. Is it on? Um, on questions, but the question about why Republicans changed their opinion and were more supportive after 17 or 16, whatever, 18, 1868, um, for the right to vote. I liked your reason, <laughs> but was there not just some practicality of wow you know if we support it they're going to be republicans and they're going to vote for us <laughs> i mean which did last for a long time and I, I mean i guess if you draw those connections right if white northerners and mostly republicans are saying oh if we give blacks the right to vote they're passing equitable progressive constitutions and they're passing good policies what kind of policies are they they're republican policies right so in that sense yes there's the real practicality of well if blacks vote they'll they'll vote for us right um but there's still a tension in the party right and and you see this with douglas when for instance 1864 uh douglas let me backtrack a little bit douglas was not a fan of abraham lincoln in his early years but by 1864 douglas is let's just say on the lincoln train right uh and he's actually stumping for lincoln across the u.s and you have many republican leaders who want him to stop right, because they don't want to be associated with blacks. And even leading up to even three years later, even though blacks are voting for Republicans, there's still a, a strong sense in the party, do we actually want blacks associated with us, right? Uh, and so there's still these like really fraught tensions. Uh, and so it's an interesting time period. And that's why I haven't exactly put my thumb on what really happens, right, in just a year's time, right, when Republicans themselves are in some cases shooting down black suffrage. Uh, to all of a sudden adopting, no, we need black suffrage everywhere in the union, right? Dr. Dr. Mellon, do you want to? Uh, next question. Back here. Okay. Coming down from the top. Hi, I just wanted to kind of touch on the subject of intersectionality and where black women stood in all of this. Is there any like kind of point of view from them that we can gather? Uh, sorry, you'll find with black women that they effectively split themselves between let's say the Douglas position and the Stanton and Anthony position. So some black women uh, along with Anthony and Stanton suggested that well, if rights are going to be voting rights are going to be given to anyone, 
it ought to be given to either women first or to all persons together. And they oppose black suffrage in this sense. But there were uh, some black women leaders like, um, I, sorry, I, I don't have my notes with me, but there are a, a few prominent uh, black women advocates uh, who sided with Douglas on this question. Uh, and I think along with him just decided this is a prudent matter and let's extend voting rights to blacks and then address the voting rights to women. But of course, this is a, uh, it's almost like a tragedy, right? Learning the story of Douglas and Stanton and Anthony, they're, they're the greatest of friends, right? Before the civil war. And then they become some of the fiercest enemies during reconstruction. And they're sort of forced to do so, right? Simply because of political realities. But that's a great question. And, and yeah, I, I think there wasn't one firm an answer for black women. I think they just each determined for themselves where they would stand on that question. Next question. Thank you. All right. So my question is kind of nuanced, but I, I wanted to kind of see if we could clarify I guess, a clarification on the idea of, of where economic equality is used to hold people down versus racial. What that is that it seems like uh, like 16th, 17th century laws based upon the issue that they're worried about. It didn't matter what race you were, if you were poor, you were going to be a problem for the state. And then it seemed like, is there a way we can kind of start to say that it started to change to where it wasn't just you were poor, then they were applying it to race. And almost like before the Civil War, it's poverty in general. After the Civil War, Jim Crow laws did affect poor people. However, they were definitely being targeted to disproportionately affect Black people because of race. So I, I just want to see, is there a way to kind of, is there like a turning point or this seems like a really good sticky point where that starts to occur where it's not just class separation, but now we're starting to do racial separation that starts to separate that now that's the distinct distinguishing factor for the oppression of like black people in general versus previously it was economic. The black people just happened to be in that same economic class to say immigrants and Irish people that were, I mean, even in propaganda, they're being drawn similar to one another. But then after the Civil War, was it more of just now it's racially driven? Um, I would love to answer that. Um, I think this is sort of a, a really crucial point, isn't it? Um, um, what, how are these intersections being used um, to discriminate in various ways? Um, and I think the best explanation is, um, okay, so there are a set of laws that discriminate against Black people that exist from the 17th century onwards in British North America. So it's very important to bear in mind that there is a whole set of laws that, that govern slavery and that governs, um, that, that, that restricts uh, the rights of, of free Black people as well, okay? So there is a whole set of those things and they, they exist in every state or every, every one of the colonies that becomes a state um, right from the North and down into the South as well um, because slavery exists in the North as well. Um, and that's based on race. There's absolutely no doubt about that. What's quite interesting though, thinking about this question of um, kind of intersectionality, which is also the word that we can use here, I guess, as well, um, is what seems to happen is that obviously abolitionist sentiment is rising in the sort of after the American Revolution, particularly, obviously there, there are people who believe that slavery is wrong all the way through. Um, and there are people before the American Revolution who believe that slavery is wrong. And particularly after the American Revolution, we start to get the rise kind of a, a, a fiercer abolitionist sentiment, particularly in the North. Um, and it starts to look bad to pass a set of laws. If you're in Ohio, so Ohio is carved out of the Northwest Territory. And as Professor Lash mentioned, um, the Northwest Territory is designated to be a slavery free zone. Um, and the, the states that spring up there are aware of this. They're not always happy with this. Politicians in those areas are not always happy with this and they try to resist it. But ultimately they realize, okay, we're not gonna be able to get away with actually having slavery here. Um, but we still don't believe in racial equality. In fact, we actively dislike black people um, and we don't believe that they are equal to white people. Okay, how can we, um, and, and we'd quite like to impose various kinds of laws that are going to oppress black people. We don't like poor people either. Uh, and we would prefer, and we would, we would definitely prefer that they weren't, you know, a burden on the taxpayer, which is that same language that we hear today, right? 
Um, we don't want poor people to be a burden on the taxpayer, particularly in areas they don't come from. Um, we also believe that black people are more naturally inclined to be lazy, that they're more naturally inclined to be poor. Um, and they're also going to interact with this sort of question of you know, people becoming a burden on the taxpayer, on the community. Um, so one of the really interesting case studies in this book by Kate Mazur that I just held up um, is basically about the fact that in Ohio, um, I think it was in the 1840s, but I can't remember exactly. There was this very debate took place. OK, so Ohio tries to pass a black, an anti-black law that discriminates specifically against black people and tries to prevent to, to sort of end their freedom of movement and various other things. But there's a lot of activism against this from black activists and other folks who are sort of saying, no, this is discriminatory. This is supposed to be a free state. So the same legislators who were sponsoring that law go away and they redraft the law and they turn it into a vagrancy law. And it just says, if we think that you're going to be a burden on the community, we reserve the right to take certain actions against you. So you see in this case study, what's kind of extraordinary is that it's the same, it's, it's got the same goal, but it's been reframed from an anti-black law to, a, to an anti-poor people law, right? Um, but it's designed to have the same effect. And I think that's sort of how all of this plays out. I hope that provides some kind of answer to your question. And I, I think uh, Bradley may well have something useful to add to that as well. Spot on, I think that's right. And yeah, it was the 1840s uh, as far as Ohio is concerned. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a real problem of like right to travel. And this is an interesting problem that uh, that Northerners, it's an interesting area to study because on the one hand, uh, especially anti-slavery advocates and abolitionists, they are staunch in what they understand to be privileges or immunities of U.S. citizenship, one of them being the right to travel. Uh, and because, as Dr. Mallon mentioned, uh, Southerners, Southern states were imprisoning, let's say, free Black sailors whenever they came into port. And this made Northerners just completely upset. They, they didn't understand but also they thought that the Constitution bound these southern states to allow blacks to travel freely. But at the same time, they didn't want blacks traveling to their states. Uh, so it's a really interesting tension uh, to study at that time. Okay. Um, my question um, can apply to anybody who wants to comment um, uh, who's spoken today, but um, because of debates and opinions on things relating to the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments um, have been going on for so many years before and after, um, could these amendments have been passed any time before or after this, the time period that they were? And why or why not? Uh, I mean, the counterfactuals are always hard to, hard to answer. Uh, my, my best guess, at least from what I've studied, it'd be a resounding no. I, I just don't think that uh, the 13th Amendment, let alone the 14th or 15th Amendment, could have been passed any time uh, before, let's say, there's assured Northern victory uh, over the question of uh, not only union, but also on the question of, of slavery, right? And, and this draws a little bit from what Professor Last mentioned. There's so many contingencies and even when it was passed at the time it was passed, um, it wasn't entirely sure, especially, again, the 15th Amendment. If you actually look into the record on how the 15th Amendment is passed, let's just say there's a little bit of dodginess on how the 15th Amendment was actually ratified. And there is a plausible or, let's say, a fair argument to suggest that the 15th Amendment is not constitutional. Um, but nevertheless, I mean... Our constitutional practice has uh, liquidated that question, and yes, it is constitutional. But that's just to show that even at that time, uh, these questions were highly fraught. They were highly tentious. Um, so to look at history and to suggest either everyone, they were all racist and they're all pre uh, prejudicial, or to suggest that they're all anti-slavery and all wanted freedom is a simple, it, it just does not account for history in, in its fullness. Uh, it's a tension that existed then, and, and we have our own tensions today. I don't know how I can provide much of a better answer than that. I mean, it's such a, you'd have to, 
evaluate every single, I mean, every single thing that happened in US history, right? I, there's actually a great article. Uh, I think it's in the American Historical Review. It's by a very famous historian of the American Civil War. And it is a counterfactual about what would have had to happen for the American Civil War not to happen. And it's focusing particularly on the question of the, 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 the Mexican War, uh, 1846 to 48. And it's something that, again, that's not I, that doesn't excite me hugely. It's not really something that, you know, um, if, if, you're, if you're interested in the history of, of sort of the, all of these big questions that we're thinking about now about rights and, you know, citizenship, I mean, it, it might seem that like it's in the background, but those are the kinds of things historians have identified as being like, okay, well, you know, if you plot out all of the events and how this could happen, then maybe if we had just taken out this guy and this president, this guy hadn't been elected president and, you know, Henry Clay had become president this time, such, such. I mean, I, I often think, uh, I, I don't know if I have the mind to sort of calculate all of these things. Um, but I think one thing that I did want to mention as, 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 as you were talking is something that is interesting um, that Erica and Kiana pointed out, obviously, is, is the, the Corwin Amendment. Um, Maybe, maybe this could have gone one of two ways, right? I mean, we could have had slavery becomes constitutional. It's not that far off actually happening. And slavery doesn't have to end in the 1860s because slavery doesn't end in the 1860s in the Western Hemisphere. And I think that's really worth bearing in mind and um, thinking about who's a hero and who's not as well, right? As, as um, Professor Ribeiro was, was mentioning. Um, slavery doesn't have to end then it's going to take a lot to get slavery to end at this point and it does i just wanted to weigh in briefly in on that great that that fantastic question and throw another wrinkle in into the discussion part of what we're we're addressing here is if it hadn't happened then maybe Maybe these amendments wouldn't have been passed until much, much later. I want to raise the possibility that we could have had the 13th Amendment much earlier. That in, in fact, prior to uh, the invention of the cotton gin and the development of that particular industry and the value that it gave to chattel slavery, right? Um, slavery was actively in question in all the mid-Atlantic states. It was only in the deep south that it completely committed itself uh, to chattel slavery. So you had major constitutional treatises and activists in Virginia calling on Virginians to end, end the practice of, of slavery. And so there was a moment, there were a few decades not long after the adoption of the Constitution, in which the country was not only divided north and south, you had very major political factions within, within those, you know, those um, those high South states that were willing to think about ending slavery after the end of you know 1808 you end the the, um, the traffic of slavery across um, across the ocean so I think we could have we could have had it sooner um, had it not been for money had it not been for money I also just want to further complicate your question because we're looking at abolition from a national perspective but it's also completely possible that we could have just exported the economy of slavery outside of America. Because if you think about it, the United States was just becoming a global empire at that point. And with colonization and with various, like Grace mentioned Henry Clay, he was a staunch abolitionist of sorts, but he also deeply believed that after abolition, only white people should live in America. So we could live in a world where all of the violence and cruelty of slavery is simply exported from our view. Okay, very good question. Hi, oh. hi, my name is Malika, and I wanted to know what inspired you guys to go deeper and learn more, um, because I think what you guys said was really interesting, and um, I want to know what kept you guys going. Uh, I can at least uh, speak to Douglas. Uh, well, Frederick Douglas, I, I would I would challenge anyone to read more than one speech of Douglas and not want to go further. Um, I mean, he's just that captivating of an individual. Um, but even more so, I mean, I just had a had a simple question. I, I I was curious about the U.S. Constitution and how 
we ought to understand that constitution. And uh, Douglas had an interesting take on it, uh, which uh, sort of sparked new questions. And so if you're looking for whether something like the Quill Project or when you're going into school, whether research in this sense is for you, um, I would just just read, right? I mean, in all honesty, just read. And, and as you think and you come up with questions, if you continually seem to come up with new questions that continue to spark your interest, then that's an easy answer. Like this is for you, right? This is, this is what you want to be doing in the future. Uh, and if not, I mean, especially with university, I mean, there's just so many different avenues you could pursue. You could, you know, be a STEM person and, uh, you know, make a lot of money as an engineer, or you could be like me and make little money and study Frederick Douglass. Um, but uh, depending on what floats your boat, but I would just say, yeah, just read, right? Just read. And, and as you come up with questions, entertain those questions, right? And, and, and keep going further, because I can promise you there's always more to learn, always more to uncover. I think that's a great, it's a great question and that's a great um, answer. Yeah, I mean, for me with this particular issue, um, I'm really, so I'm really fascinated by American federalism. I'm super interested in like the mechanics of how government works and something that really fascinates me about you guys' system is that it's so complicated having lots of different governments that technically have sovereign authority of some kind. We can argue about that, that word sovereign, right? Um, and particularly in this period before, <laughs> particularly in this period before the American Civil War, when that those tensions were so, so rampant. Um, I also, in thinking about this particular question of citizenship, I'm so fascinated because people seem to impose so many different meanings on it. Um, and we've just been talking about this question like, oh, does being a citizen mean you have to have the right to vote or not? Like, what does that make women, all the women? right, um, in the period before um, women's suffrage um, and that kind of thing. So I think uh, there is so much fascinating there. And I would say, I think this, this, this idea of like, yeah, go read some history books if you're interested in history um, um, and it could be on anything. I got really interested in the Russian revolution many, many years ago. Um, and, and also there's so much great history content that isn't just books. Um, something that if you guys are further interested in this particular topic, um, I always recommend to all of my students to watch the PBS Reconstruction documentary, um, which is where I got a lot of my knowledge about Reconstruction um, because it features some of the best scholars um, of a certain time um uh, on this 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 period some of the people who are doing all the research and then they are on the telly telling you um telling you what 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 they know without you having to do any reading um so there is so much great history content out there if you're interested in this and, and you can just go find it and I, I wish you luck with that on that excellent question we're, we're going to draw this session and our conference to a close so thank you all for your questions for joining us and please let's Applaud our speakers one more time.